G'day legends, I hope that you're doing great. Now I'd like to thank Bryce Bryington, a former US Marine and a combat veteran who served in Ukraine, who was wounded and returned home. And he was also awarded the Courage of Order Medal for the personal courage shown in the defense of the state's sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, self-sacrificing performance of military duty. So I really enjoyed this and thank you Bryce again and thank you you guys for um, staying with me and watching some of these longer episodes. Enjoy. I like no rules. No rules is nice. No rules. No rules is very nice <laughs> when you're podcasting. Yeah. Well, Bryce Byington. Yeah, buddy. Love that I have you here and talking to me. Yeah, man. Thanks for the uh, the invitation. No, no. Thank you for, for everything and you bought donuts. Donut, donut holes, man. They're the they're the thing. They're the um, bee's knees. I figured you hadn't had them yet, so yeah. I was like, I'm snagging them. No, nah, never. And you got out of the car and you're like, I've got you some like breakfast treats. And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, they're real good. So if people hear me chewing away on the podcast. It's the donut, the donut holes. Like, they're, like, they're like crack. <laughs> but they really are, man. Like you start eating on them. I mean, I did sprinkle crack in there also, yeah, but exactly. like they're, they're like crack. And then you're going to gonna ring the TSA and be like, oh, there's some guy <laughs> coming through the airport next Tuesday. <laughs> Yeah, he's gonna have a bag of donut holes. They're, uh, they're not donut holes. <laughs> you see those memes where it's like, um, oh, it was just a prank, man. Settle down. It's like the prank, <laughs> like throwing them out of a plane. Yeah, I watched. I watched one just just exactly like that. It was uh, uh man, what was it? It was this dude. They got him like obliterated drunk one night, and then like they had this whole doctor set up. And, like, so when he woke up the next morning, like, he was in a hospital bed, like, in a hospital room and all this stuff. And they were saying that, you know, like, and they even did, like, fake makeup on, like, themselves and stuff like that. And they're like, yo, man, you've been in a coma for 10 years. And they're like, they're like, they're like and he's, like, trying to figure stuff out. And they're like, and then they bring in, like, this 10-year-old kid. And they're like, yeah, this is your kid. You know, you were seeing so-and-so. And, like, y'all were pregnant and you didn't know yet. But, no, this is your son. And, like, all this stuff. And they can, no, oh, it was, it was bad. It like was bad. scumbags. I laughed. I thought it was hilarious. I love I love having mates like that. Oh yeah. Yeah, they they definitely put some time, thought, and money into into that prank. It was God, hilarious. Damn. Well man, how are you? How's everything going? Man, dude, it's going good. It's going good. Just trying to, you know, uh adapt back to civilization. Uh just started a job last week, so you know, just getting getting back into the routine of being a civilian. Being a civilian again. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, the the adaptation backwards is, is not that easy. It's not, man. It's not. Um, it's real easy to go from civilian to, like, soldier, but it's real, real hard to go from soldier back to civilian. Yeah. It, uh, just uh, the, the day-to-day life is a lot more difficult. Why do you think that is? Man, I don't... I You know what? I know exactly what it is because when you're in combat, it's easy. It's easy. You wake up, you go on mission... You get shot at, you go home, eat, sleep, repeat. Mm. It's easy. You know what you're doing every single day when, when you're when you're at war, you know? You, you, you know that you have missions. You know that you're going to go to work. And, you know, you just hope that you come home. That way you can repeat the same thing the next day. Like, it's real easy. And then when you're in the civilian world, you got to worry about, you know, working, job, making enough money to cover, you know, all your bills, food, you know, leisure time. You got to, you know, it's a, a lot of stress. And then you got to deal with, you know, the bullshit of people around you yeah yeah and, and you, you you're incredibly correct and you're not you trust me you're not the first person who said this to me about like when you're away doing something like that and even i've had this, you've just got one job and that's it, that's it. but if you come home and you're like, i've got to pay my i've got to pay my registration on my car i've got to pay my tax i've got to do and you're like wow my day's so full of bullshit yeah man <laughs> it's bullshit dude it really is yeah. um and like i mean it's just i had a, I had a buddy post on facebook it was like uh Man, what was it was like one of those like little memes or whatever, and it was like, what's what's harder, being in a relationship or uh, being being at war? And like all my buddies that we've all been to been to war, we're all like, relationships harder, relationship. I'd much rather be, or maybe that's what I think that's what it was like. What is easier? And we all commented, war. War was easier. Yeah, you know, like way easier. Man, it's, it's true. Which yeah. is it's it's kind of hard to for people who haven't done it, you know, kind of fathom like. How is it so easy? Because like, it's easy. Yeah. You just you just wake up, get your kit, load up, go go to work, and then you come home. Yeah, and that's it. That's it. That's it. It's really that. It. It's yeah. that. It's that. That's that is the day. Yeah. No. But it's been like that. Like if you read any like old stuff, it's been like that for warriors of men for 
thousands of yeah, years. Yeah, for, forever, yeah, yeah. Like, you read, read about, like, the Romans and the Greeks, and when they, like, went away, like, that was like that. that yeah. They just marched this way for a month, <laughs> sort down someone and come back. I'll be, I'll be I'm glad we don't march for right. a month straight to go have a three-day fight and then march all the way back. But, you know, we, we march heavier now than we ever have. Mm -hmm. I saw this thing the other day. It was, like, um, warriors through the ages, and it was everything from, like, basically... When we were just, you know, cavemen mm -hmm. through the medieval times, whatever, through to now, and it was all the weights, and it was like normal, like typical infantry soldiers now carry more weight than like a knight in armor, like with your pack, with your weapon, with your wow. with your own armor. All yeah. this, it's actually heavier, hmm. and this is a big problem that people are pointing at in defense industry about like how much weight can we expect these guys to have? Because new tech is awesome. Mm -hmm. A new tech is great. It is. But you ask any infantryman, and you're like, but I've got to carry that. i got to carry that. Yeah, my, my, my back tells people, the defense ministry, otherwise, on how useful all this kit and equipment is. And my back is destroyed. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I'm mean, i sure you've heard Rob talk about his back being destroyed, carrying carrying all that, that, that weight. And I'm sure yours probably is, too. Like, yeah. It's a lot of weight. Oh, yeah. It's a lot of weight. I mean, and... Yeah, it's nice having all that really cool, fancy stuff on the battlefield, but in the grand scheme of things, all you really need is beans and bullets. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Beans and bullets. So let's let's rewind a bit. Where did your sort of military experience start? Yeah, so um, it started in uh, 2013 uh, when I went to the Marine Corps here in the States. Um, I'd say I didn't, I didn't do any ROTC or anything like that. I just went straight straight to the to the marine corps right after right after high school um became a uh became an mp uh not by not by choice i kind of got i got i got shafted by the good old marine corps yeah the big old green weenie did i tell you you can transfer while you're in <laughs> yeah they did they did say that but i also don't want to be a cop in real life <laughs> not not i didn't want to be a real cop i don't want to be a real cop i mean being a fake cop was kind of cool because i mean you don't have any powers, but everyone thinks you do. So you just you're you're a glorified security I don't guard. Know if everyone thinks you do, or you guys think that you do. I will agree. There's a lot of MPs that think that like they are the guy. MPs ego. Oh man, we always dude. say like you know like these as, as, um, special air service where like Sandy Berets where like yeah, it'll go like it'll go like as far as like egos, they're at the bottom. <laughs> Yeah. But they've done the most. They've done the most. But the yeah. MPs have done like the least. Nothing. And they're at the top. Oh man, the red dude. Berets. <laughs> man, dude. There, there was times that I would have, I'd have Marines like they would, they would come in, you know, get them boot Marines like boot boot. They come in and they, you know, chest puffed out. Da, da, da. I'm like, hey man, you're just a glorified security guard. That's it. That's it. Because as soon as anybody crosses that baseline towards the other way, guess what? We can't do. Yeah, nothing. Nothing. You can sit yeah. there and wave, wave as they go do whatever they want to do. Ring and see Paul. Exactly, and then yeah. and then even on base, like okay, cool. You know, you get somebody for driving drunk or beating their wife or whatever. Guess what? It doesn't go on their civilian record. Mm. It only stays on their military record, depending on 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 the, the severity, severity yeah. the severity of it. But ninety five percent of it doesn't go on the civilian record. Yeah. It's only military record. So I'm like, oh, you're just a glorified security <laughs> guard. That's all we are. But yeah, so. Uh, I did. I did. Uh, I did that. Um, uh, never got a. Never got to deploy or go to a, a cool field unit and go do some some cool guy stuff. Um, I got out in 2016 uh, on a hardship discharge when my parents were killed, and then I kind of just floated around. I thought about going doing contract work. I thought about going back to the Marine Corps, but my wife at the time said, "Absolutely not. We're not playing that game." So we didn't. She knows best. <laughs> she, knows best. she she knows. Clearly, she knows what's best. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I did that. Kind of just bounced around from job to job, and then um, couldn't. I mean, just even even then, like just to, even though I'd never been to war, just the military mindset in general was kind of like hard to adapt uh, back to to civilian life. Um, and then February happened, and uh, I'd already known about the war um, because when I was thinking about doing contract work, you know, I was just looking at different conflicts around the world and saying, all right, cool, there's probably a contract here, there's a contract there, whatever. So I knew roughly a little bit about it. But at the time, I really thought it was just kind of like a, a, not a civil war, but pretty close to like, you know, just kind of a, a dispute on where they wanted the, 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 the country's border, basically. Um, and then February happened and I started, you know, watching all my telegram channels and the news when 
it was actually on the news. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't like watching, you know, just the, the mass genocide, you know, just civilians getting murdered in the street and everything like that. So I, uh, I decided to go to Ukraine. And then, uh, yeah, that was that was fun. And what did your partner think of that decision? <laughs> so I don't, I don't, I don't have a partner anymore. That was, uh, my my ex wife left me in uh, 2019. Uh, so I didn't. I just, it was just me, myself, just and I. It was me, me hanging out with the boys. Oh, yeah. That's what. That's all it was. Yeah, nice. yeah. Uh, I can tell you, my my family didn't want me to go. Mm. I got cussed out by my sister. I have don't think I've ever heard so many swear words in such a short amount of time <laughs> until I told her. I was like, I was like, hey, I'm going to Ukraine. Yeah. And I was nothing but you stupid motherfucker. Like it was probably like that a hundred times in like a ten second window. Damn. I was like, I started laughing. Like while she was while she was yelling at me on the phone, like I just started laughing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's crying. She's like, "What's so funny?" I was, I was like, "I'm just nothing's funny. I'm just laughing. It's just <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just laughing." Damn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah. So I uh, and what's actually what's actually crazy is I didn't I didn't even know how to get to Ukraine. Like, I didn't know how to join their military. I didn't know how to do anything. So I hit up uh, a couple of my contract buddies. And uh, I, was, I was like, yo, is there any contracts over there? You know, I'm trying to get paid while I go do some some cool stuff. And uh, they're like, no, we don't have any. I don't, we don't know of any contracts over there or anything like that. So um, I was like, man, how am I, how am I going to do this? And then I saw Zelensky, you know, did the International Legion thing. I was like, boom, there's my golden ticket. Got it. So I, you know, I sent my, you know, basically my resume to the to the embassy, and uh, a week went by and I didn't hear anything, and I was like, man, that sucks. I was like, well, you know, they're probably getting flooded with a million different, you know, basically applications. I was like, mine probably got lost and lost in the chaos. So I sent another one, and about a week went by and nothing again. I was like, man, this is bullshit. I was like, how am I going to get over there? So I went to Reddit. Like any, you know, logical person does to get solid, good information. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Like, there's no f- bad information on Reddit. No. It's 100% factual. Yeah. It's all good. So uh, somehow I got a number for a Ukrainian commander. And I uh, messaged this guy. And I was, like, I was like, hey, partner, you know, I'm so-and-so. These are, you know, my basic qualifications. Uh, how can I How can I join, you know, your unit in the Legion? And he sends back, he goes, buy a plane ticket to the safe house in Poland. Let me know when you're there and we'll get you into Ukraine. And I was like, that's like no information. I was like zero information, actually. Just yeah. this little bitty hotel in a small village on the border town of Ukraine and Poland. So like I'm shooting him messages. I'm like, hey, man, like, you know, like what unit are you with? Where are y'all fighting? What kind of equipment do y'all have? You know, because I want to know. For when I'm going, like like what I'm walking into. Yeah, yeah, nice shit. Um, is it as bad as, you know, like some of these people are saying to where, you know, you get a rifle, you get a magazine and yeah, yeah. To help defend the country? Or, yeah, amongst or, yourselves. Exa- yeah. Exactly. Or, or are you actually, you know, a well-established unit? Um, and he, he basically just replied and he goes, let me know when you, you get to the safe house in Poland and we'll get you into Ukraine. I was like... Man, this is sketchy. This is like the <laughs> this is like the the little white van that's driving down the street that says free candy. You know, I'm, I'm like, hmm, I don't know. So I bought a plane ticket naturally, yeah, because I would jump in the free candy van too. You know, speaking of candy, yes, <laughs> Dude, eat away, man. They're good. I, I munched on a whole bunch of them on my way over here. They are good, but um, but yeah. So I bought a I bought a plane ticket to Poland, and uh, it was funny. I my, uh, some of my family members they're like do you know anybody over there? Like, who are you going with? You know, yada, yada, X, Y, and Z. They're wanting all this information. And I can't tell them, no, I don't I don't know anything. I'm just going to wing it the whole time. Uh, so I'm over there telling them, like, yeah, you know, I got buddies from the Marine Corps. You know, two of them are over there right now. They've, they've been fighting for the last couple of weeks. They said everything's good to go. You know, I'm, I'm going to be getting paid. You know, it's contract work, yada, yada, X, Y, Z. Just laying it on thick form. That way they stop hounding me with a million questions and trying to convince me not to go. Um, so I, I make it, I make it into Poland and when I land in Poland, there was air defense like all over the airport. Yeah. It was, it was weird to see like, yeah. cause I landed in uh Zhezhov. Yeah. So like all down the runway is just air defense, air defense, air defense. I was like, we're in Poland. Why, why is there air defense all the way over it's here? Like what? Nerve, it? it was unnerving, man. I was, I was like, what the heck is going on over here? 
And uh, I was like, I was like, well, you know, it's I've come too far to turn around and jump on a plane and go home now. Like, you know, let's let's see what this is all about. So uh, I messaged that commander and told him that I just landed in Poland and I was heading over to uh, the, the the safe house, the little the little hotel, and uh, no reply. I was like, okay, cool. So I get a taxi to this uh, to the to the to the hotel. And it was like 45 minutes away from the from the airport. And I was like, man, this is going to be a steep-ass taxi ride. I'm like, damn, I don't want to shell out all this money for a taxi. But I wasn't thinking about how cheap things are over there. 45-minute mm. cab ride, I think the bill was like 20, 30 bucks. Yep. I was like, we need these prices in America. Like, yeah. like these, I, I could Uber all day for this. I, like, I like to think that, and correct me if you think I'm off, but Poland is a third the price of America. I think everything just divided by, like, by a third, and that's the price. Yeah, yeah. For, for for the most part, I mean, I'm sure once you get in, like the main cities, like big cities, you know, obviously it goes up. But for the most yeah. part, yeah, I'd, I'd completely agree with you. You know, Poland is like you know two thirds the price, yeah. which I like it because yeah. it's stupid expensive over here. <laughs> um, but uh, so this so this this taxi guy, he doesn't speak any English, maybe like a couple of words. So uh, we he he drives me to this hotel, and we're in the middle of nowhere, Poland. And uh, he dropped he drops me off. I was, I was like, "Is this the hotel?" And he was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." yeah. I was like, "All right, cool." So I, I walk I walk inside the hotel. And I, was, I, was, I was like, you know, said hello, asked if anybody in there spoke English, and she was like, "I speak a little." I was like, "Perfect." And I was, I was like, "I need to get a room for the night." She's like, "I don't have any rooms." I was like, "No, no, no. You're you're supposed to have a room. Like, I'm I'm here and then going to Ukraine tomorrow." And she's like, "I'm sorry, I don't have any rooms." So then I was like, I was like, "Is this?" Is this the address? You know, is this is this the hotel? And she was like, "No." I was like, "Oh, you got to be kidding me!" My taxi already drove off. My taxi's already gone. And like I said, we're in the middle of nowhere. I don't know how I'm gonna hail a cab. So I was like, "Where's this hotel?" And all she did was like point out a window, and she was she she said over there. And I was like, how, I'm, "I'm trying to ask her like how far, you know, because I'm about to walk it. So I need to know if I'm about to be walking, you know, ten kilometers or two hundred meters." And, uh, she didn't, she didn't say, she just, she just kept pointing and, you know, started speaking Polish and I was like, perfect. I don't know anything you're saying. So I'm just going to walk this way. So at this point I have my deployment bag, my sea bag and a backpack. And I'm just going down like this old janky road in, yeah. in, in old <laughs> <laughs> wheel, wheel in my deployment bag, you yeah. know, just doing my thing. Starts raining on me, of course. I'm like, why wouldn't it start raining? Like, why wouldn't it? Yeah. And uh, about a, about a kilometer down the road, there was this little little hotel, and that was it. That was the spot. And uh, uh, same thing. I tried speaking po uh, English to the receptionist, and she spoke very little. And she just saw my equipment. She and all she asked was Ukraine. I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to Ukraine. And she said, and she kind of like waved for me to come over, and we went into where they their dining area and there's a loft over their dining area and she pointed up there and then there was a several other people in there speaking english and one of them came up to me and he started you know asking me if i was going to ukraine yada 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 and then he was speaking polish to the receptionist and um basically he took me up to the loft he goes all right man this is where we're staying you know there's like several mattresses laying on the ground they ran extension cords up there so we could have you know power and stuff like that i was like all right man like I, like i need to pay her like how much is it? like no it's all free I'm like if, if you're if you're going to ukraine it's it's free to stay here for the night i was like oh wow that's cool so that's what we stayed in this little hotel for free message the commander again i'm like hey you know i'm i'm at the safe house you know what's next uh nothing so i call, keep i call him several times that night nothing well, one of the foreigners, he had a vehicle, and he's like, he's like, hey, I'm driving to Ukraine tomorrow. Uh, you want to come with me? And I was like, yeah, at least I'll be in Ukraine. I can figure it out once I'm in Ukraine. Like yeah. that's that's the hard part is getting into yeah. Ukraine. Yeah. I'm like, once I'm there, I'm sure they're gonna have recruiting stations on every corner. You know, it's gonna be easy. So we did went in went into went into Ukraine that way. Just drove drove right on in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, this foreigner guy, uh, he ends up being a clown, like a big clown complete fraud shouldn't shouldn't have ever been in ukraine there's a lot of that isn't there man dude there's i keep saying there's more clowns in yep. ukraine than there are in a circus yes fictional characters that's oh, what they call them oh, yeah fictional characters dude like yeah, living I, out their own oh, story man dude there's i can't tell you how many times and at first like when you 
for depending on like who they are and like how much experience they've had, you know, lying or, you know, because a lot of them will hang out with like real guys. And then once they get found out that they're frauds, then they'll break off and go somewhere else. Yeah. So some of them, they have pretty good stories and pretty good one-liners and stuff like that to where you think, okay, hey man, this guy seems a little weird, but like, you know, he says stuff that you would kind of only know if you are legit. Yeah. So like, okay. Um, but yeah, man, there's an ungodly amount of just people that don't need to be there because yeah. all they're wanting is to do it for themselves. And then what's funny is like, if you, if you give them an opportunity, like, Hey man, you know, I got a unit, like you want to, you want to roll? Let's, let's go. Oh no, nah, man. You know, I got, I got, I got something with my knee, you know, the way, the way my knee, you know, I, I was, I was fighting over and, you know, da, 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 da. I was fighting in Mariupol and, you know, I got blown up and I'm like, that, that doesn't add, but uh, okay. Yeah. You know, just, man, there's yeah clowns everywhere out there. But, uh, so this was one of the clowns. Um, but he was like, he was like, uh, and this before I found out that he was one and he goes, he goes, Hey man, I, you know, I got some meetings. Um, you want to, you want to roll with me? And I was like, yeah, sure. I'll roll with you, you know, find a unit or whatever. And, uh, our first meeting was with Damien who was at the time, like the, the lead spokesperson for the Legion. Um, so went, went and had a meeting with him and, uh, he tried, you know, his best sales pitch for us to join the Legion. And this is after we've heard, like, a lot of negative things about the Legion. Because this what is... What month was this? This was uh, April... I, I walked into the country April 1st, so April 2nd. That's still very early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very, yeah, very, very, very early. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's only been going on for about a month. Month mm -hmm. and some change. So, yeah, month... Or uh, April 2nd is when we had these meetings. Or at least with Damien. And, um, you know, so he's trying to, you know, sell us on, oh, no, you know, it's not like that. You know, it's not like this. It's not like that. I'm like, I don't know, man. I've heard a lot of people say very similar things, <laughs> and none of these people knew each other. Um, and I think also a lot of that is, is and, I, and I would catch myself doing it a lot also, even while, while fighting, is comparing the Ukrainian military to the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. And... I would catch myself doing, I'm like, man, this is bullshit. You know, this would never fly in our, in our, in our military, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then like, I'd have to sit down and like, after I calmed down and being pissed off, I'm like, this isn't, this isn't the U S military. Yeah. This is, this is a completely different military, completely different rules, regulations. Yeah. I was like, I was like, you gotta, you gotta get the, the U S military mindset out of it. And that's one thing I, I think a, lo a lot of foreign fighters when they're over there, that's why they get so pissed off about the Ukrainian military and they talk so much shit about the Ukrainian military is because they're comparing it to their country's military, yeah. which it, it won't be like. Um, and again, like I, I would catch myself doing it also. But, uh, but yeah, so we had that meeting with Damien and um, we were like, all right, man, you know, we got a, we got another meeting, you know, in a couple of days or whatever, you know, we'll, we'll get back with you, let you know what, what we're going to do. And this other meeting was with the right sector. Um, and I didn't know anything about the right sector at the time. Nothing. Didn't know who they were, what they were, nothing. So the guy that I was with, he's, he's you know, he's kind of giving me a little rundown of them. And I'm like, hmm. So I text my buddy, one of my boys back here in the States, who who used to go fight with, uh, he actually fought with the uh, the YPG and everything like that. Um, or he was a medic. He didn't fight with him. He was, he was one of their medics. Um, but, uh, I was like, yo man, like I need a, I need, I need a good fucking Intel sheet on, on, on these guys. Cause I'm about to go have a meeting with them. And what this guy is saying is a little weird. So I need, I need an Intel sheet. So he, you know, later that day, he sends me like, you know, this is who they are. This is what they've been doing. You know, this is their military record. This is their political record. Yada, yada, yada. I'm like, okay, cool. Got you. Now I'm ready for the meeting. Easy peasy. And we go to this city center and they're like, you know, somebody will come out and meet you. I'm like, all right, cool. And uh, we're sitting there waiting for a few minutes. And all of a sudden, like this dude in like all black starts walking towards us, like black BDU top, BDUs, black shiny boots, bloused, everything. I'm like, I don't know much about this people, but I got a feeling <laughs> That's the guy. Like, well, a betting man. <laughs> and I am. <laughs> I definitely am. 
yeah, so this this dude comes up and, you know, broken English, starts talking to us, uh, asks us, you know, are you so-and-so? And we're like, yeah. He's like, all right, follow me. So we, we go into this uh, this building, which was a storefront. And then, uh, well, it was a store. And I think, like, their, their door just kind of, like, was out of their store. But it's like this big steel door. And, like, he had to, like, hit a buzzer and, like, look up at a camera. And then you hear the lock pop. And he swings open this big steel door. And I was like, hmm, it's weird. Walk up these old Soviet steps to another big steel door where he pushes a button, looks at a camera, and it buzzes and pops. I was like, this is really weird. I was like, I might just die. Like, I'm, I'm, today might be the day. I I didn't even go fight Russians and I got killed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was I, I was fully expecting it. And uh, we walk into this room and you know there's several people in there. Some some chick was in there. You know just hanging out. And then uh, a few of them left. And then we kind of kicked off our meeting. And it was super chill. It was way chill. They just wanted to know like who we were, what experiences we had. Uh, they even made jokes and were making sure that you know we weren't uh, fictional characters. Yeah. You know, wasting their time and doing stuff like that. And uh, after probably about an hour, you know, uh, they're like, "Okay, well, you know, we're we're forming an, an international battalion. You know, we'd love for y'all to join." Uh, and based off of what I knew of their military, you know history from 2014 on i was like yeah these guys are a hell of a lot better than the legion like all day i'll go with these guys over the legion so we we're like yeah man let's let's do it um they're like all right cool you know contracts will take roughly two weeks or so and then uh you know we'll, we'll get at it we're like all right cool so we went back to lviv and we're like we're just gonna hang out in lviv you know party for two weeks i guess until we get our contracts and then uh the next morning, it was weird. Everything happened, like, super quick. Like, it was almost, like, next day, everything. Like, even if we didn't have anything planned, like, something would happen and we yeah. would do something. And the next morning, we were at breakfast in the hotel, and this uh, this dude from the U.K. comes in, um, also a clown. He's legit. Like, he has fought. Like, he has done things. He was in the British military and everything like that, but he's a clown. And... uh but he was like, he was like, we were eating breakfast, you know, speaking English. He comes up to me, he's like, hey, you know, are, are y'all y'all here to fight? Y'all here to do stuff? We're like, yeah, you know, we're waiting on our contracts right now. He's like, well, while y'all are waiting on your contracts, you want to uh, come train at our at, at this training facility that I'm working at. And uh, I was like, I was like, honestly, dude, I've been out of the military since 2016. I know I'm confident in my skill set. For, for me and like, you know, to make sure other people around me are safe and, and, and good. But I don't know about actually like training yeah. people. Uh, I, was, I, was like, I was like, I'm, I'm, I got a lot of rust on me to actually start training. And he goes, he goes, man, don't worry about it. He goes, any little bit of knowledge that you have, it, it, it goes, you know, it, it's better than um, them not having any knowledge. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of true. So he was like, you know what, just come by, check it out, whatever. And if y'all want to do it, do it. If you don't, don't. I'm like, all right, cool. So later that day, we we went to that training facility. And uh, I thought he was running it, and, but he wasn't. He was just working there. It was actually being ran by this other uh, um, British officer who was, uh, he'd, he'd been to like Afghanistan, Iraq, and stuff like that. Like he, was, he was a pretty squared away dude. And he was actually... Think of like the like the most posh like English officer. Yeah. That was him. They're the best. Oh man, dude, he was really cool, dude. Like I, I I ended up you know really really enjoyed working with him and 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 you know hanging out with him. But yeah, literally, literally you know the the perfect. Okay, I'm just gonna restart this yeah. camera. So you can keep talking. Oh, I can keep talking. <laughs> but um, but yeah, like you know, like the perfect the perfect posture. You know, shoulders back always. He always had the you know that mysterious look on his face, like interesting like doesn't matter what you said it was always yeah. hmm. you know just the very very like stereotypical proper english officer yeah that was him so uh so you know we sit down with him that that day and you know talking and you know he's like he's like yeah man you know we we do all this training here you know we we keep him for a week and you know i was like you teach how many courses here in five days six days and it was like six or seven classes. Like, it was a lot. Like, recon, patrolling, vehicle recognition, map reading, CQB, uh, or Fibua. I think y'all call it Fibua. 
I'm out. CQB. I'm out. Are y'all call it CQB yeah. also? Okay. Uh, yeah, because they, they they kept calling it Fibua. Oh, really? I, was, I, was, I was like, what the heck is Fibua? Yeah, I have no idea. Uh, fight, what is it? Fighting in built up areas. Oh, yeah. Makes yeah, sense. Yeah. I was, I was like, oh, Mount. Like, we call it Mount in, in the Marine Corps, you know. Um, uh, and I was like, but CQB, C, CQB, CQC, whatever. And, uh, but I was, I was like, man, that's a, and there was other, there's medicine and some other classes. I was like, dude, that's a lot of classes. I was like, just one of those courses alone is a minimum, a couple of weeks to a month, yeah. you know, in, in our military is like, there's no way we're teaching all this stuff in five, six days. I was like, it's impossible. CQB is weeks and weeks. Oh dude, the C- CQB alone is a minimum of three weeks. And you're still shit after three weeks. Oh, you're still <laughs> horrendous. That's just that's just getting like the very very basics of how to properly step into a room. You yeah. know, that's not actually the the, the fighting side oh, of God, it. No. Yeah, so I'm I'm like and and I love it. Like CQB is my bread and butter. Like I I love that thing. Um, and uh, so that's why I even told him I was, I was like, man, CQB alone is you know three weeks a month long. You know, two three weeks. You know, whatever. And, uh, but he said the same thing, he goes, you know, any little information that we can give them is better than none. And we need to try to give them a little bit of all of this stuff because they're probably going to encounter all of this yeah. stuff, you know, out on the front. And I was like, yeah, man, you're not wrong. I guess it's just wild. Yep. Like this is wild, but he goes, Hey man, you know, y'all take the day bounce around from, you know, different classes, you know, and then. Let me know this afternoon if if y'all want to if y'all if you think you can help out and be a part of it. So with you know CQB being my little my, my little baby, I uh, I walked into the CQB class. I was like, I gotta see how they're teaching this. Like, there's no way you're teaching CQB in a week. And uh, so I walked in, and it was also being done by uh, an English officer. Um, he's a nice guy, uh, so I don't I don't want to bad mouth him he's, he's he's a nice guy he means well he just didn't i don't think he fully understood what he was teaching so it, even within the first day like he's teaching stuff and like i'm pulling him aside i'm like hey man like what do you think it'd be best if we did it this way because you know not telling him like dude you're absolutely wrong don't ever show him that you know but kind of hey man you know if i was teaching class i would do it this way because yeah. And he was like, oh, man, that makes sense. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. So even the first day, like, I'm over here, like, you know, like, hey, man, like, hmm. So, uh, so I ended up actually taking taking over the class and, and taught that for a few weeks and then uh, still waiting on the contracts from the right sector. And uh, we contact him after two weeks, and they're like, oh, you know, we're still finalizing, you know, the international battalion, our brigade. Um, you know, it's – Give us, give us, a, you know, another week or two. I'm like, all right, you know, we're doing stuff over here anyways. Like, take your time, whatever. And uh, the English officer who, well, actually both of them ended up leaving. Um, but the main one that was running the entire program, uh, he he left and kind of kind of threw me in charge of everything to run the whole program, which was overwhelming. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's it, it was like, I was like, yo, man, like. I'm just supposed to teach one class, one class only. Like that's that's it. Like I'm not here to teach a class and maintain the the integrity of the entire operation. Yeah. No, I I had to. Uh, but it was it was cool. It was it was really cool. Ended up meeting a lot of Ukrainian commanders because you know I'm sitting there you know trying to talk to them to get them to send their guys to us um, for training whenever like they rotate back on R and R and stuff. And it was all free. It, um, we actually I spent. At this time, like I've like spending ten thousand dollars to be there, like we weren't getting paid or anything. It was all volunteer work. Um, but ended up running the program for for a few months. I was there, I think, in total like four months. Ended up telling the right sector, you know, hey man, f off, you know, we're not we're not going to run with y'all. Um, and then after a while, I just got tired of teaching. I was like, man, I want to go fight. I came here to fight. I want to go fight. There's and that I was, I was like, I was like, I don't want this war to be over before I ever actually like step off and go fight. Um, so I met another Marine buddy of mine. Um, he he actually worked at our at the training facility for about a month or two, uh, teaching uh, combat medicine. And he went back to the states for a month or two, and that and then he he was back in country at this point. And instead of teaching combat medicine to the school, he he was teaching it now to. Um, medics on the front line who needed that information right then and there 
Um, so I was like, yo, man, you cool if I, if I come help you teach medicine? Um, and then while I'm doing that, I'm going to be looking for a unit to join who, who wants to have me and, you know, I can go fight. He was like, yeah, man, no biggie. So uh, went, went with him, and uh, we lived in a church for, like, two weeks. It was weird. It was really weird. And it was it was actually funny. So like I met him, he picked me up. Uh, he picked me up in Kiev, and uh, then we drive the hour and a half to where we were staying. And uh, on the way there, he was like, "Hey man, just let you know, it is a church. So no, no having fun in the city and bringing them back. And you know, and I was like, man, you could do that in the church. He's like, he's like, no. <laughs> I was like, man, that sucks. Um, but uh, so we get to the church. And, uh, you know, I got my, 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 my kit and gear and everything with me and I'm bringing it up in and, uh, there's, you know, a door guard, you know, just an old, an old man and an old woman, they, they rotate, but they open the door and I'm waiting for my buddy to walk in. Cause I don't know where I'm going in this church. I don't know where we're staying at. I don't know anything. And, uh, he, he was like, he's like, go on in. I was, I was like, all right. So, you know, I, I go on in, I, I walk into like the little foyer area and I turn around like wait, expecting him to be right on my heels to show me where we're going and he's still sitting outside just watching me i'm like yo dude you coming in he goes yeah i'm just giving it a couple of seconds i was like for what and he goes i'm just waiting to see if you, you know combust and burst into flames or not i started laughing i was like dude you're an asshole <laughs> i was like you're an ass I was like, that's funny that's funny he goes Honestly, dude, I, I thought you might burst into flames. That's why that's why I stayed out here. <laughs> He's like, I didn't want to go down with you. <laughs> I was like, I was like, whatever, dude. So we so he 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 ends up coming in and you know what uh whatever. But yeah, it was cool. So we ended up um staying there for two weeks, I think it was, something like that. Um, meeting some really, really nice, nice people in this little this little village. Well, I say little village, it's more of like a small town. Um really nice people. Really nice people, man. Uh Went to different different units uh, uh, in the south, uh, teaching combat medicine, and then found a unit in Mikolive that I was going to join. So uh, ended up talking with them, everything like that, and they're like, "Yeah, good to go." And even though I was all the way in Mikolive, I had to go all the way back to Ternopil, all the way in the west. So I was all the way, you know, southeast of yeah. Mykolaiv, and I had to go all the way back to just like, it's like an hour from Lviv yeah. to do my paperwork. Oh, damn. I was like, you got to be kidding me. So went all the way back there to spend a week doing paperwork, um, met some interesting people, met uh, Drunk Johnny, who... Uh, Drunk Johnny? He's the he's the American that defected over to Russia. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Drunk Drunk Johnny is the is the is the name for him. He's a man, dude. You you could you could probably have a whole series just on that dude. Damn. Yeah, man. He's a he's a very interesting individual that needs a lot of psychiatric help, mm. a lot. Um, but yeah, so I stayed out there, stayed in a stayed in a little hostel, and I've never stayed in a hostel before. Oh yeah, ever. I'm not sure if I'll ever stay in a hostel again. <laughs> what, man, dude? So. The the lady was nice at the reception desk or whatever, but when I walked in uh, to my room, it was a small room, which is fine. I don't need a huge suite. Um, had two beds, had a little cupboard. The cupboard was completely destroyed, smelt like mold and mildew and must. So obviously none of my stuff went in there. Um, and my but my bed was on this old rink-a-dink spring um, bed frame. Like the little bitty coil springs that ran all the way across. And all those were like bent out of shape, you know, sagging, stuff like that. So somebody before me somehow got this big, thick wood door and put the door on there <laughs> with this little bitty cotton mattress over it. Yeah. And that's what I slept on. Damn. Yeah. And then I ended up, after like the second night, nobody was in my room with me. So I grabbed the mattress from the other one also and slapped that on. But that didn't help much because that was also another very thin cotton pad. And then my shower, this was middle of July, towards the end of July. So it was warmer outside. Um, but the, the shower didn't have hot water. And it didn't even have cold water. It had ice cold water. Like, I'm pretty sure the water ran through chillers before it came out of the tap. 
Like it was, it was cold, 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 cold. Um, but uh, and it was just gross in there. There was there was mold, rust, and everything. It was ten out of ten. Don't recommend this hostel yeah. in in. Turn we'll avoid that one. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Maybe other ones are nice. I've heard great things about other hostels, and I'm just like, mm, I don't know, I don't know. So spent a week there. I ended up getting my contract and everything like that. And then I went to Mika Live, and that's when that's when all the fun began in Mika Life. Yeah. Started started fighting out there. Um, you know, doing the Lord's work, getting shot at, a lot of IDF. A lot of IDF. So that's what was like your first experience with my with first the combat? Yeah. My first experience with combat. Man, so my first experience with combat is actually so the very first mission I went on where we got the potential of of possibly being killed. It wasn't an actual like real combat situation, like what people will think. Literally, so we we did we ran this mission, and it was supposed to be like a really big, huge, massive assault with like several different units, all timed, delayed, and and stuff like that. Um, so we uh, we pile up in this zombie. There was. Three, four, five, six, seven, seven to eight of us in one Humvee. You know, guys sitting up on top of the top of the Humvee. I'm in the turret. You know, we got guys in, inside also, and we're we're going down this little dirt road, uh, and we start taking IDF. And uh, I was I was like, man, that's cool. You know, just watching this big explosion. You know, 7,500 meters away from us. I was like, man, that's cool. And then kind of getting a little closer, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> uh, but then uh, you know. Our translators down in the Humvee, but none of us in this unit, nobody, we, we, we didn't get any mission briefs or anything. So we don't really know what we're doing. We were just told, hey, you got to come here. There's Russians over here and over here. Y'all have to take this position. But didn't really give us a how or, you know, what resources we're going to have, you know, nothing, nothing of that. Like there's no real information in our brief. Didn't know where our drop-off point was, how long we were supposed to be at, you know, the target site. If we were to capture it, you know, what our parameters were for, you know, um, retreating or exfilling, you know, nothing. And um, so we're driving down and the, the guy stops in the middle of the, of the road and we're like, yo, is this our dismount area? And we hear you hear them speaking Ukrainian and our, our Russian in in the uh, in the Humvee, and uh, none of us speak Russian or Ukrainian, so we don't know what they're saying. And then all of a sudden, you know that he starts driving again. We're like, all right, cool. This is in our dismount area. Noted. He drives a little bit further down and stops again. He kind of and we're like, all right, this must be the drop off point. Nope. He kind of like kind of like drives a little bit further. And then, and then he probably drives a couple, a few hundred meters, and then like pulls off into the trees, and we're like, "This has to be our drop-off point." And then, sure enough, you know, I, I see guys inside the vehicle start start bouncing out, and we're like, "All right, man, time time to roll." So I jump out of the turret. They, they jump off the top. We open up the back of the Humvee because we all have day packs and and rockets. So we're back there just grabbing shit and just chunking it out, chunking it out. And then while one guy was still on like the bumper, like digging in the Humvee to grab, you know, one last rocket or bag or whatever he was grabbing, this Ukrainian starts, like, hauling ass in reverse and almost, like, slams him up into a tree, like, behind us. And he was able to, like, kind of, like, stop before he hits the tree and he, he jumped, the dude jumped off. But as he was, like, changing gears, you know, it, it rolled back again and almost ran him over and, like, tweaked his knee a little bit, but he was good. And this Ukrainian, like, hauled ass off. And we're like, all right, cool. It's like, you know, we're, we're in our area, so, you know, we all we all spread out, get a little bit dispersed, and we jump into the tree line. And we're asking our translator, like, like all right, hey, where did where did he say, you know, the tree line that we're supposed to advance up is? And he, he goes, it's it's down that way. We're like, all right, cool. Um, he goes, but we know we can't advance until the other unit that's before us uh, accomplishes their task. And once they accomplish their task, then we can we can move forward. So we just, we just lay low. We kind of start... Dig, dig in a little foxhole or a little shell scrape to kind of to kind of get us get us a little bit submerged into the ground and i got cows walking all around me like in this tree line i, I think i had like six or seven cows like walking all around us and uh, i'm talking talking to my buddy he's from canada 
uh, and we're like, you know, man, like, you know, we're going to, we're going to eat good tonight. You know, one of these, one of these mortars is going to take this cow out, you know, we're going to cut, cut it up right here, throw it in our bags and, you know, we're going to be eating good, you know, just make, making jokes, you know, just, just shooting the shit. And, uh, we got IDF coming in, you know, 25, 30, 50 meters, like it's kind of, kind of getting close, but it's still all indirect. Um, but I started making jokes to the dude and I was, I was like, cause he, he'd been, he'd been, uh, in Afghanistan I was like, I was like, hey man, you know, is is war really like this? Like, is this is this common to get like this much IDF and stuff? And he goes, eh. He's he's like, I've I've taken IDF, but never this much this this quick. And I was I was like, oh okay. And like a little bit of while later, goes down probably another 30, 45 minutes. Still still laying on our stomachs, you know, just kind of hanging out. No, there's no small arms fire, no nothing. I mean, we hear small arms way off in the distance, like way in the distance, but. Nothing for around us, just IDF. And uh, I asked him, I said, I said, hey, man, I got a weird question for you. He's like, send it. I was like, is it, is it weird that I got a chubby right now? He started laughing. He goes, what? I was like, dude, I, I don't have like a full boner, but like I, like I definitely, like I definitely got a chub. And he started laughing. He goes, yeah, man, that's, that's kind of weird. And I was like, hmm. All right, thanks. But yeah, that was. But uh, that that was the mission, you know. Um, we didn't we didn't end up doing anything. We ended up exfilling um, because one of the 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 units before us didn't accomplish their task, and we got dropped off in the wrong area. I think we were we we found out like we were like almost a kilometer away from where we were supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, oh, when we were exfilling though, um, we did get chased by a drone. That was scary. Like, like, cause like we all jump into a, uh, uh, a pickup Humvee and, uh, there's probably 10 or 12 of us just like all stacked on top of each other laying in this thing. Cause we're still taking IDF the whole time we're X filling and everything. So we're not trying to stay stagnant for too long. And, uh, me and, um, the can Canadian dude, um, we were actually like almost falling off the Humvee the whole ride. Like I was laying on the side and people, the only reason why I stayed in is because there was two guys grabbing onto my vest, like holding me in because my rocket was on my back, pulling me out of yeah. the Humvee. And we get and all of a sudden, like I see this drone, like pop up over the tree and he starts and like, we're hauling ass down this road and he is hauling ass, like trying to catch up to us. Damn. And the only thing I can think at this time, because very, very first day, very first mission is this dude has, or this drone is loaded with fucking frags. And he's about to start dropping them on us. And there ain't nothing we can do because we're just hanging out in the back of this fucking Humvee. And then I started thinking, I was like, if I fall out of this Humvee, I'm not hauling ass away from this drone anymore. And he's definitely going to be able to tag me with this frag. So I hit my GoPro. And at this time, I had a piece of shit GoPro. Like, I think it was like a Hero 3 or whatever. And battery life on it was like maybe five minutes yeah. if I was lucky. Um, and I'd already used up all my battery. But I, I clicked it. And I thought I heard it go off because, like, I was trying to, like, film this drone chasing us. <laughs> and uh, we, we get back or whatever. Uh, it obviously never caught us. And uh, I, was, I was like, oh, man, I can't wait to check out that GoPro footage, you know. So I pull up my phone. Like, we're back at the base. I pull up my phone. I, I, I pair it to my GoPro. And I'm like, where the fuck is the video? Didn't get it. I was like, damn. GoPros are so unreliable, man. Man, they, they really are. I mean, I, well... The se uh the second time I went back to Ukraine to fight, I had a the Hero Eleven, the one that got blown up in the trench. That thing was amazing. Yeah. I loved the shit out of that one. That one was great, but it was also like a brand new, top of the line GoPro. It wasn't one from whenever the Hero came out, two thousand and five, two thousand and six, <laughs> yeah. like whatever. You know, <laughs> technology has advanced a little bit, but yeah, um, but yeah, that was my that was my first combat mission, and I I don't want to say it was a technically a combat mission because we didn't do anything we just sat in a tree line and made jokes all day yeah. like took idf but that would be technically my first my first combat mission yeah well when when was the time you would say was like your first oh that i would say i think the first mission i think it was when we got ambushed or I say ambush. Our unit got ambushed. It was a 
retaliation on another unit, but our unit got ambushed um, by like four BMPs and white phosphorus dropped on us. Tell us about that one. Yeah, that was a wild story. <laughs> we like wild stories. Oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah, that was that one was um, so we um, so the unit I was in was uh, like a recon unit, um, like a small recon strike unit. And uh, we get told, hey, you know, we have friendly forces in this trench right here um, about a kilometer away, two kilometers away. There's another tree line uncontested. It's no man's land. And then roughly a kilometer past that is the Russians. And we're like, all right, cool. Um, our job was to go into this, uh, take the uh, the tree line that was that nobody was in. Um, there was possible a possible Russian OP that overlooked it. If there, if we did see the OP, um, we were to eliminate the OP. There. Um, and then kind of just set up shop and wait for Ukrainian uh, infantry unit, you know, to take over and do their thing. And then also, you know, gather whatever intel you can while, while you're out there. So we're like, all right, cool. Um, so we step off from base like middle of the afternoon, late afternoon. And um, we get to our, our friendly tree line and our trench Right as, like, sun was starting to set. And then um, our translators talking to the Ukrainians that are that are in the trench, kind of getting a little, a small sit rep of the area, you know, where they believe the Russians are, X, Y, and Z. And then they're like, uh, all right, so you got to go down this tree line to get where you want to go, and then that tree line's over there. And we're like, all right, cool, cool, cool. And then they're like, there's a minefield in that tree line. And you're like, there's a what? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it opens up that way. These two pastures, like can the, the tractors can drive from pasture to pasture in this tree line. And in this open pasture right here, there's a minefield. And we're like, is it anti tank or any personal? Because if it's anti tank, we'll just walk through it. It's like, whatever. And they're like, no, it's personnel lines. And they're like, good, cool. Why, why wouldn't it be anti personnel lines, right? So we're like, we don't have an engineer. And none of us know how to do anything with mines. Damn. I said that. I know what to do with a mine. Steer clear of it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a mine over here. Cool. I'm going to walk about a kilometer that way and then come up. Like, I'm staying so far away from that mine. But, um, but yeah, so uh, we eventually, after about like an hour or two, finally got an engineer out there. And now it's like dark. And we have a couple MVGs, but... We don't have the rhino mounts for them, so they're handheld MVGs. I think we had, like, one thermal, um, and that was that was it. So they wanted us to walk through a minefield at night with nothing. And we're like, yeah, no, that's not happening. So we waited until sunrise, and then as sun was, like, slowly starting to peak up, um, that's when we went. And our engineer, he didn't demine the mines. He just marked them. Um, with like these little red sticks, which was fine because it at least told us where they were. So we walk through this minefield, we walk to our observation point, and we get to the tree line, and everything's perfect. And we're like, all right, cool. So we call in the uh, the infantry to you know come come relieve us. We didn't see an OP or anything like that, and we can hear the Russians' artillery and mortars, and they're roughly. I would say anywhere between five and eight hundred meters, like give 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 or take, and um, so we're hearing them, you know, volley mar uh, artillery and mortars all day long. And while we're in this tree line, we will hear a drone zip by, but like they don't stop at our tree line; they're just literally zipping back and forth. And um, after several hours, I was the rear the rear man pulling security. And I see the Ukrainians coming in. I'm like, all right, cool. It's time for us to leave. And they show up about 30 deep. Zero tactics. Walking through the middle of the tree line. Um, not sticking underneath trees. They'd walk through open areas. They were dragging stuff, making all kinds of noise. 
And I was like, man, that's not good at all. Like zero, zero tack, zero discipline. Um, but anyway, so like we, we start packing up shop. I'm like, all right, man, it's time for us to get, you know, infantry's here, time to go. So all my guys would kind of pack up shop. And after like 30 minutes or so, we haven't gotten the word to, to leave yet. And we're like, well, why not? Like we should be leaving. And now probably about 45, 50 minutes after they got there, we, uh, we started hearing um, drones buzzing. And, like, they were sitting on top of us. And we're like, like, that's not good. Like, these drones saw these guys move in. Like, we need to get the fuck out. And probably about an hour, 15 minutes go by. And we're like, hey, we need to leave. And we're, we're running this up through, through our translator who has the radio to our commander. And the commander gets back and was like, no, that's not our infantry. That's another unit's infantry. You have to wait till our infantry gets there. Fuck. So... We're like, this is bullshit. But what can you do, right? So we sit there and wait. And probably 20 minutes go by after we find this out, and then we start hearing small arms. Still in the distance, but closer than it's been all day. And um, we're like, man, where is that? Is that the guys that just walked in? You know, is that the Russians that are right there? You know, what? what is it what's going on and we're trying to figure it out and we we hear some some bigger guns start going off and we're still trying to figure out what's going on and all of a sudden we we're hearing more small arms kick off and then there was a uh, a crack right next to my face and then the dirt kind of like popped up in this little in this little ditch that we were sitting in and i was like oh we're definitely getting shot at 100 percent getting shot at but at this time, we still don't know exactly where the Russians are. We don't know where their positions are. We just know that they're in these tree lines over here, but we don't know where. And come to find out, they didn't know exactly where we were either. They just were shooting at the tree line. Um, but uh, so we're waiting. We're trying to figure out, like, hey, man, like, are we, are we kind of hunkering down for this? You know, are we returning fire? Like, what are we doing? And at this point, we start hearing, you know, 30 millimeter cannons kick off. And we don't have any armor in the area. Zero. So we already know it's all them. Do you have anti-armor? We, we, had, we did have yeah. rockets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all had rockets. But um, we didn't have any, uh, like, no, per, like, we didn't have any BMPs yeah. or tanks or anything like that. Um, so we're like. That's definitely Russians. That's the the Russian support element for for these guys in the artillery, and um, so we're we're trying to figure it out. You know, kind of waiting for for word from from higher, like what we're supposed to be doing. And all of a sudden, oh, and and at this point, uh, this time we're we're starting to get uh, mortars, artillery, and cluster munitions dropped right on top of us. Just just, and this isn't IDF. This is very direct. Like they're hitting the tree line, and they're they're getting real close to us. So then all of a sudden we start hearing, um, you know, a lot of commotion in the tree line down coming towards us. And they're like screaming and yelling and just screaming, go, 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 go. Well, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out what we're doing. We're getting the fuck out. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's time to get the fuck out. So all of our kit was, was packed up. So literally I just threw my threw my my day pack on i grabbed my rocket in my hand and we start we start running and uh while we're running you know trying to get like small small intel from the guys that were, were further up and again we're still getting heavy um 30 millimeter fire heavy mortar and artillery and cluster munitions and um we had uh this one bmp it seemed like he was tracking us specifically because like there was trees blowing up next to us and like it was getting wild so we all drop and, and get real real low and uh while we're doing that again more explosions are going off right in front of us you know i'm hearing stuff blow up over my head and i'm hearing cracks and snaps and it sucks because like i still don't have anyone to shoot at yet like my, my AK ain't going to do nothing against a BMP and I can't see the BMP to shoot my, uh, I think I had a Matadors, the rocket that we were carrying around or the Matadors. Um, I think that's what they're called. Is that, that's yeah, right? one called. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like from like 
Belgium or something. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Real peaceful country that make real sophisticated weapons. This thing does do work. Bro, it's like Sweden. Sweden is like the most peaceful, like oh, da, 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 nation. But it's like ah, oh, we build all this shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, uh, you know why that is? You know why they're so peaceful? Because they have all that yeah, shit. That's, that's <laughs> they have all that to and be peaceful. Got the history of being fucking Vikings mm. all the way through to Soviets on their border. Exactly. Yeah, they're like, they're like I mean. Y'all can fuck around and find out if you yeah, want, like but like, things. yeah, but I don't, I don't recommend it. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but yeah, so we, uh, we all drop down and you know, we got, we're, 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 we're yelling intel at each other, trying to figure out, you know, where these BMPs are at, where we're getting shot from, you know, just trying to, trying to run down a, a, a game plan while we're getting completely destroyed. And uh, finally, we just decided just to keep hauling ass, moving moving further down the tree line and getting away from the situation that's over here. And um, so we, we go down the tree line, and then there's like a little T-intersection. We're supposed to come back down this tree line towards our, our position, our friendly position. And uh, while we're doing that, we're not, we're not taking the mortars, artillery, or the cluster anymore. That's still on this tree line over here. Um, but while we are still kind of running, uh, we can see a BMP roughly a kilometer away, about 800 meters, kilometer away, very small little speck out there. And at first we were like, yo, let's, let's shoot it with these rockets. And then we've never shot these rockets before. They just kind of gave them to us. So, so we asked one guy, he, he was from, he's from Finland. Really, really cool guy. Really smart guy. He's been, this was early mid August and he's been fighting since like the first week of March. Yeah, like, right. so like he's been, he's been doing it. He's been getting it. He's, he's used everything that we got. And he goes, no, 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 don't, don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. He go he goes, it's too far away. It's past max effect. And we're like, okay, cool. What's max, what's max range. He goes, maybe 800 meters. And we're like, Oh yeah. He's at least 800 meters. Like we're not yeah. about to say we could shoot it, you know, kind of throw a little arc on it or whatever, but then he knows where we are and we're fucked. So we decided not to, and we used to keep trucking down this tree line. And then all of a sudden we hear, you know, a couple, a couple of cluster munitions pop over us. And then we hear something flying through the air and it sounds really close. And then all of a sudden like it popped, but it was like a weird pop. It was a pop like, like we hadn't heard before. Right. And we're like, that's weird. I was like, maybe that was a like a weird dud or whatever. Yeah. Well, it wasn't a dud. It popped, and we're like, man, what's that? What's that? Like, what's that smell? And as like we're trying to figure it out, and this is all within like seconds, like our milliseconds. You know, your, your brain just kind of starts doing everything. Everything instantly just engulfed in flames. Mm -hmm. Everything. The, the the field to the left, the field to the right, our tree line, like the up in the air, like up in the tree, it was on fire, and like different parts that it had fallen and hit the ground was on fire. They dropped white phosphorus on us, which, if it wasn't, <clears throat> you know, horrendous and a war crime, I would say that's a genius idea because we're getting bogged down over here. They see us fleeing over here, so they're gonna stop something right there to where we we have to stay in this area where they can where they can get us. So. Tactfully, it's a genius idea. Like I, I, I thought it was smart even at the time. Um, but I had already gotten it in my head that, uh, like, I wasn't scared. Like even, like at first when we were first taking the 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 cannon fire from the BMP, you know, butthole kind of clenched up a little bit, and I was like, oh, this sucks. Like, and kind of freaking out a little bit. But then I realized I was like, you know what? If I get tagged by anything, I'm not gonna feel it. No, no, 30 mil. no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to feel it. I'm just going to be running and then I won't be. So I quickly, you know, just accepted that I'm probably going to die today. Uh, and like, I was cool with it. I was like, I was like completely, completely content and okay with it. And it's weird how calm you can be in such a crazy situation. If you just accept the fact that you're probably going to die. If you're okay with dying and like that, that's probably exactly what's going to happen. Oh man, everything is so much clearer. Like everything, so much more clear. But uh, I wasn't ready to burn alive. I was scared to death. That as soon as soon as, as soon as that fire lit up, I was like, oh, "Fuck this!" 
Like, that's my number one fear is burning alive. Like, I don't care if, like, I'm getting shot at or not. Like, I'd rather get shot in the foot a hundred times before, you know, I catch on fire. But uh, so we start running through that, and that was hard to breathe. Just the the phosphorus itself, you know, breathing in, and then also breathing in all the smoke from burning all the crop and the twigs and the grass and everything. But uh, we ended up making it back to our tree line. Um, found out that we were getting that infantry unit that did come in. They were tasked with assaulting that Russian element that was right there. Right. Yeah. The they, BMPs element. Uh, well, so the BMPs were their support element. Right. That was their, that was their you know, QRF and stuff. Yeah. Um, they were tasked with... W- I guess whatever that artillery unit was that was in front of them shooting, that's what they they were tasked to to assault. They just forgot to tell us, like as they were walking by, hey, we're 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 gonna go fuck these guys up. Yep, you know, they ended up telling you know like the two or three guys that were at the very very front of our patrol in our in our in our uh, uh, unit, and they're like, hey guys, y'all y'all want to come with? And they're like, no, you know, we're we're tasked with staying here. Like that's what we're gonna do. And they're like, all right, cool. But, like, it never got relayed to anybody else. Yeah. So, somehow, miraculously, none of us got hurt. I mean, a little bit of smoke inhalation. Um, but for we were all solid, you know, nothing nothing bad. I think uh, out of that Ukrainian element, two or three of them ended up uh, dying. And then uh, a few of them got injured. But how none of us got hurt or killed was pff, mind-boggling. Like, we all should have died. All, all of it because there was there were, ended up being like four bmps because like we were on this tree line two of them were here and two of them were right here right. so they're just just sandwiching us yeah like per- perfect perfect um tactics and and like honestly that's probably how i would plan it out also just sandwich them come come back and forth down this tree line and keep them keep them hunkered in while you're dropping mortars and artillery on them but uh yeah none of us none of us got hurt but i would say that was my first real even though i didn't shoot anything um i had a lot of stuff blowing up right it was just like a movie you know like when you know like somebody's like running through like a like a world war ii or world war one movie like people are running through the forest and like things are literally blowing up everywhere it's exactly what it was like damn yeah yeah that was that was a wild time that's wild so <laughs> when was like your big like what would you say your like biggest firefight was biggest firefight like, what's one that really stands out to you? Well, I don't know. Me getting blown up kind of stands out a little let's, bit. Let's talk about that. <laughs> well, yeah, we haven't talked about your yeah. injury and everything. Well, yeah. Let's go over that. Yeah, man. Um, where do you want to start? Let's start at the beginning. Start at the beginning. All right. We can go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> the world is your oyster. Fucking know. Um, all right. So, we I'd, I'd been in a few uh, small firefights and, and, and engagements um, be, because again, most most of so the unit that I was in this time, um, I mean, you've you've talked to Yuri. Uh, I was I was with Yuri. So a lot of our a lot of our missions, recon, recon by fire, you know, but also strike strike elements, you know, yeah. go in strike and then probing attack stuff like that. Um, but I would say my my biggest biggest engagement was yeah when I when I got when I got blown up. Um, we. Uh, taking it was a big again an, an, another big movement we'd assaulted this exact same trench twice before and and got into small ticks and stuff like that um but this time it wasn't just our unit that was assault well i tell you that it was just our unit assaulting this trench but there was a whole bunch of other units around us taking other positions around us as well so we had to take our trench before anybody else could do any of their stuff. So it was very, very important that we took our trench. Yeah. So it started off with a tank shooting five or six rounds at it. And then uh, our Humvees come up on the side of uh, the position that we stepped off from, which was roughly 170, 200 meters from the Russian position. And they're just laying down all kinds of hate and discontent on this position with the 50s. So we're on the opposite side of the tree line pushing pushing up. And uh, we take a little bit of small arms. So we, we start engaging back to it as we're moving up. And 
of course, nothing goes according to plan. As to be expected. Why? I mean, we we only trained on it this exact mission, you know, every day for the last four days. You know, you sh- should go flawlessly, but you know, yeah. So, soon as soon as we stepped out of the trench, actually, before we even stepped out of the trench, it already it already started going sideways because I wasn't supposed to be the point man. Somebody else was supposed to be the point man, and uh, well, he's a fucking pussy, so. <laughs> I ended up becoming the point man. Um, so we uh, we make it all the way up into the trench. And uh, at this point, I had not stepped foot in a Russian trench yet. I hadn't even come up to one. Like, we've, we've gotten close and, like, we've done other things. Um, but actually, like, being in a Russian-held trench, I hadn't, I hadn't done it yet. So... Um, I was excited and nervous all at the same time. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a weird feeling, dude. It was, I was, I really was, I was excited, nervous, um, overwhelmed, but also completely calm all at the same time. It was, I don't know how to describe it other than just saying like a whole bunch of things that contradict each other because that's exactly how I felt. That's cool. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was nervous, but calm. I was excited. Uh, but anyways, um, so yeah. So ideally whenever you get to a trench is jump in it as quick as possible, right? Just overwhelm the enemy, uh, by fire maneuver. Uh, that's, that's how you accomplish your task. Uh, but it's, we've also been told by a lot of guys for months, even when I was in Mykolaiv, because right now we're not in Mykolaiv, we're just outside of Donetsk, um, that the Russians will sometimes booby trap their positions, you know, especially if they know that they're about to be overran. Um, they'll, you know, set up some type of claymore or set up, uh, they'll, they'll arm a, a frag grenade and kind of like prop it up against something to where you barely touch it and it, the pin, uh, the pin goes off. But, um, so we get up to the position and end up becoming like a shooting gallery for the, for the Russians. Like we're just all big old gaggle fuck right on the end of their trench. I'm lobbing a couple grenades, uh, shooting into a couple different positions. Um, and once I assess that this immediate area right in front of me is good to jump in, I, uh, I jump in, I see that there's as while I'm standing there, I see like a small hole, like right at the the furthest side of the trench where we're at, where somebody could easily fit. And then I thought it was a tunnel. So I, I jumped in there and immediately just shot one round right into this little open area in the, in the ground. And, uh, just in case somebody was sitting there, you know, they're, they're at least catching one round before they get me. Um, ended up being clear. Nobody was in it. So I start pushing down this, this trench line and, uh, I see that it, um, uh, it, it breaks to the left and then shoots back across. And where it broke to the left is where um, their little bunker is, right? That's where they go for if they're taking mortars and artillery and all drones and stuff like that. They can go hide in there. And it's being blocked by this big, thick blanket like fire retardant blanket and i don't say fire retardant because i'd watch it like catch fire real quick and then like immediately go out um so i see that uh and and so they're they're back in there and i saw i saw uh at least one to two russians like as we were approaching like i saw them like duck into it so i know that they're in there somewhere how far it goes in how wide it is what what it does once they're in there i don't know i've seen all kinds of things to where it can go in and stop right there and then i've also seen from from positions that it can go in and be kind of like vietnam you know where it fucking tunnels sit to like different rooms and shit like that so i don't i don't know um so i'm just sitting in there and i'm just you know don't don't throwing frag grenades in there you know, shoot, shooting a few rounds in there, um, trying to suppress them, but also if anybody's sitting right there, you know, fucking them up. Um, one of my boys, also an American, he's, he's hollering out at me that he, he's going to push around the backside. And when he coming across there, he, he yells at the, you know, there's a, there's another hole part of the trench line. So I tell him to stop. I, I throw another frag grenade on that side of the trench, just in case if somebody is laying low in there or something like that. 
Um, that goes off. He and a Ukrainian jump in over there. And now we're... Um, here, actually, probably better if I just draw yeah, it. Yeah, do it. So... Tree line's right here. This is the tree line. And then we all kind of, you know, just gaggle fuck right here. And the trench comes this way. Let me record it. Yeah. Yeah. So the trench trench comes this way. There's a... The bunker that I'm talking about goes in this way. And then the trench follows back off this way. So all this right here... Um, let me see if I can draw it this way. There we go. That's better. So I'm right here at this point, and I can't see any of this. Right. So that's when my buddy, he, he jumps over here and tells me that there's a hole. I throw a frag grenade over there. So is he out of the trench? So he was in the, out of the trench. He was, like, back over here, like, in, in the trees and shit like that. Yep. And once I threw the grenade and cleared it over there, he and the Ukrainian jumped into this position uh, right here is where they ended up sitting at, right in there, to where they could see down in this way into this bunker, and then I'm sitting right here and i i keep looking that way and shooting and throwing grenades down into to the bunker right over there but um so <clears throat> he uh we're just back and forth i'm just throwing grenades throwing grenades shooting i tell um the ukrainian behind me i tell him i'm like, I'm like hey man like, i think i've already thrown into the bunker bunker alone three or four grenades mm. and i'm like hey Tell them to surrender. I'm like, and now I'm starting to question if they're even alive. I was like, man, I, I've thrown a lot of fucking grenades in here. Like, they're they're probably all just fucking minced meat. Um, so he yells out, which was funny because I I speak some Ukrainian and some Russian, and uh, but not enough to where like I can yell out a command to tell them to come out and stuff like that. But basically, the the rough translation of him telling them to surrender is <laughs> come out fast. <laughs> and he, he said it and I kind of I kind of laughed to myself and and I was like I was like tell him again and he, you know he told me he's like he's like come out fat <laughs> and uh no well, they, they didn't want to come out so start did I yell back no nope, no nope. okay. there was there was no noise no nothing from them so that's also kind of why I'm, I'm like I think there's I think there's someone there and at this point my my boy he goes hey there's a there's a shooting port on this side I can drop a I can I can uh you know so, a grenade. Yeah. And I told him to hold off because I knew where this shooting port was because I saw it when we were approaching. Because um, it's, again, in this bunker, this is all underground right here. Yeah. So, it's not real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So all of this is underground. This this shadowing that I'm doing is, is the top soil. Oh. Right? So my buddy's over here, and he saw a shooting port somewhere in this Man, my drawing skills are phenomenal. <laughs> so somewhere in this little area, there's a shooting port that he saw. And I saw it when we were approaching because they were shooting at us from this area. I, I was watching yeah. muzzle flash and smoke and dirt. Um, so he was talking about getting out and throwing a frag grenade right there after we already told them to surrender. I tell him to hold off because I don't want him getting out of the trench and exposing himself if we don't need to. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm always about, you know, minimal risk i mean it's war so we're going to be putting ourselves at risk but as little as possible yeah so i was, I was like i was like i even told him i was like i think there's still guys in here let me throw a couple more grenades let me do a couple things and then and then we'll we'll work that out so i throw a couple more grenades i start shooting again and my garrot decides to start fucking up um the gas block on it started coming out and we've we found out that the gas block is a piece of shit on these grots because my same buddy that's in the in in there with me while we were in an engagement one day his entire gas block blew out of his rifle yeah so that's good. oh it was what a perfect time for your gas block to blow out in the middle of a firefight do you have secondary do you have no. Non mill? No. <laughs> nope. Nope. We have our rifle. Okay. Rifle and a few grenades. That's it. Man. We didn't we didn't have any anti armor with us. We didn't have anything. We had our rifle and a few grenades. Bullsy. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so my mine and being the point man, mine starts, you know, going out. And I'm like, oh shit. 
So I don't even think about like at at this moment in time to like start fixing it and stuff like that. I immediately just to the guy behind me, I was like, I was like, give me your rifle. I was like, I was like, give me your rifle. So he hands me his AK, and um, I immediately just turn around and start blasting into that hole again, just in case you know, with me not shooting or throwing grenades in there, they were starting to work their way out. So I blast a few rounds in there, and I tell him, I'm like, hey. Tell him to surrender again. Tell him to come out. Or you know, we're just gonna keep you know giving him hate and discontent. And while he's yelling at them, I'm I'm kind of like fucking with my gas block on on my garrote, and I still have his rifle with me. Um, so he gets done yelling at him. I poke my garrote back forward just to you know give it a couple of test fires to see if it's gonna work. And uh, all of a sudden, it started working again. I was like, perfect. So I handed to him his AK bag. I lob a few more grenades, and at this point, um. I'm getting ready to tell my boy, hey, drop a grenade. But I was like, let me let me throw one more. So I threw it. I watch it go off. And then um, uh, I poke my head back around to, to like, assess, um, you know, what what's going on. And as I'm poking my head back around, uh, that's when I just got, like, this big old wave of energy and dirt all in my face like a big flash and the very like that that split second i was like did i just walk into my grenade like did i just walk into my grenade i was like there's no way i just walked into my grenade i was like i was like one i know for a fact i watched my grenade blow up on the ground like i watched the you know the the energy and and dirt blow back on the ground level i got hit face level and i'm six one so i mean it's it's way higher than anything that i've been throwing and then while i'm thinking that I'm also like, shit, they might be they might be trying to assault out. And while I'm thinking that, I'm also evaluating myself. I look down, I'm like, I'm like, all right, cool. I got some blood on my shoulder. Um, I, I looked at my my arm, I could see a little bit of blood poking through, you know, my 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 combat top. And I saw my shoulder and I immediately wasn't worried about it because it was just like superficial bleeding. It wasn't arterial bleeding. Um and then the, the thought, you know, came into my head that they might be trying to assault out. Like, they just launched a grenade. They're trying to assault out. So I immediately just poked back in and just started started shooting. Um, and then my eye filled up with blood. And again, no pain at this point. Zero pain. But my eye just literally looked like if you were to, like, take a, a bag of blood and, you know, hold it up to the light, that's what it looked like I was looking through. So everything's just red. Just red, red. Yeah, 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 and it and it filled up, and like it filled up from the top down. Like I could watch the blood like trickle trickle in, um, which was weird and cool all at the same time. Like, like the start of a James Bond. Movie. Yeah, that's exactly yeah, why yeah. I say like exactly what I say. Like um, the only th- only thing I was missing was you know the boo doo boo doo all the hot chicks <laughs> and, and all the hot chicks walking around <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so once uh once my eye filled up with blood. I was still kind of under the impression that they might be us trying to assault out. And, um, I, I, I called out, I, I, you know, I shot, shot a few more rounds and everything like that. I was out of grenades, so I couldn't prep and throw one. Um, I, I'd already been snagging grenades from other guys. Um, so I, I hauled out that I was hit and that I needed to back out. And even when I hauled out, I was hit my, my buddy, he goes, are you good? I was, I was like, I'm good. I just, I can't, I, I can't I can't be here. <laughs> like I'm completely ineffective at this point. So he ends up taking over. I back out of the trench and I ended up walking back to our starting point um where the Ukrainians there, like I'm speaking broken Ukrainian, like asking for a medevac, you know, asking how bad my face is. Cause I don't know how bad my face is. Yeah. Um I again I don't feel any pain. But I, I don't know how boogered up I am. I can see a little bit of blood on my rifle and stuff like that. So um, you have one eye red and one eye clear, do you? Yeah. And there's still fighting going on everywhere else too. Like this system, that's only your little sector, I'm guessing. Like there's still yeah, yeah, that's chaos true. fucking everywhere. Exactly. Like your universe is to this yep. point. Yeah, yep, yep, yeah, yeah. So there's Russian trenches, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. good so so this tree line so this this trench this tree line comes back another roughly 800 meters or so right. and then there's a tree line that splits this way and this way and there's russian positions right here yeah that are being shot at by artillery and tank fire and stuff like that 
And I want to say that there was like a Russian position like way over here somewhere. Um, but yeah, my, my universe is right here. Yeah. Um, so there, I, I still hear, you know, tank rounds going off. I hear, you know, these supporting elements trying to fuck some people up from somewhere and stuff like that. Um, I'm hearing our artillery, their artillery, and uh, get into our trench, and I'm, you know, trying to ask for a medevac, how, how messed up my face is, and I've already, on my walk back to that trench, I've already done, you know, a personal quick evaluation while I was walking, you know, I was, I was like, all right, cool, I got my finger dexterity, I was like, I'm talking out loud, and I thought my GoPro was still rolling, I didn't know that it was completely obliterated, so like, I'm talking to my GoPro, I'm like, all right, cool, I can think, I can it's talk, on chest, it's, on my, it's on my helmet, it's on my helmet, yeah, um, so I was like, cool, I can think, I can talk, I was like, I taste blood, I, I spat and there was some blood in there. I was, I was like, all right, cool. You know, I'm probably knocked one of my teeth loose or something like that. Um, I'm even calling out. I was like, all right, like I, I touch up here. I'm like, I'm like, all right, that's sore, but like, it's not excruciating. Just kind of, you know, doing like a small medical evaluation on myself while I was, while I was walking back. That way I knew what was wrong. The only thing I couldn't do was my face <laughs> and Obviously, I'm not touching my face to see, like, how much blood is on it in my hands once I touch my face or whatever. So I get into the trench, and they the, there, there was a couple of Ukrainians in there, and they immediately grab me. They grab my rifle and take my rifle away, which you're supposed to do. Yeah. Um uh, and I was, I was like, whatever, dude. Like, I can't I can't use that thing right now anyways. <laughs> like, whatever. Uh I start pulling, peeling my eye fac off just to put some type of compression bandage on my, on my face and my eye. Um... And one of the Ukrainians, he took over and he did that for me. And I keep asking him, I'm like, where's, where's this medevac? And they're they, they, they basically telling me, like, there's no medevac. And I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to walk to one then. I was, I was like, give me my rifle. And they're like, no, just, you know, sit, sit here, stay here. And I was like, no. I was like, I know what we're doing right here. Yeah. I know what's going on right here. These Russians over here are not going to like what we're doing to their friends over here and they're about to they're about to start sending in some help. I can't be here cuz I can't fight right now. I mean, I, I can like if I absolutely had to be, but it's best that I'm just not there because of, you know, I'm just not combat effective with one eye. Um and I also don't know how bad my face is. So, I end up I kind of feel bad for the guy. I pushed, I pushed him out of the way and just grabbed my rifle, ripped my rifle out of his hands and turned around and I walked back. I walked almost like 800 meters to a kilometer back to our very, very first dismount point from the Humvees. And while I'm walking through like our trend, like friendly Ukrainian trenches. Um, and at this time I, I just speak English. Like while I'm walking through, I don't even try to speak Ukrainian or Russian because I've been told that there's times that when I speak Ukrainian, I sound Russian. So yeah. it's just best not to, it's yeah. best just as uh, no Russians are speaking English when they walk through. And all these Ukrainian uh, trenches know that there was Americans walking through. So I'm just speaking English as I walk through and they kind of looking at me like, what the fuck? And uh, finally get back to our, our dismount point where my, my team is at. Some of my Ukrainian guys are at with the Humvees and the fifties and stuff. And uh, at first, they thought I was just, like, somebody that was injured. They didn't know it was me. Um, and, and then somebody, somebody yelled out, like, who are you? You know, I was, I, was like, I was like, it's sleazy. I need a medevac. Man, I, it's like almost telling, like, these guys that, um, that, that like, I just, like, I just saw, like, the Grim Reaper and, like, Jesus was coming. Like, they all, like, jumped up. They fucking grabbed me. They started, like, taking my my equipment off of me, my kid off me. They they weren't even supposed, like, they were trying to yell at one of the commanders to get permission to take the Humvee to, to run me to a medic vac point. And the commander was like, no, we have to have the Humvees here for the 50s. And, like, I'm hearing this conversation, and they're, you know, they're, they're all speaking, you know, Russian. And, like I said, I can understand broken broken russian and i and i just keep hearing the, the the commander you know saying no stay here and that's what i was planning on doing i was like fuck it i guess i'm staying here whatever at least i'm a good ways away from engagement if something happens and then all of a sudden two two of my guys two of the ukrainians they just grabbed me threw me into a humvee and like hauled ass and i was like all right that works cool uh, so they they hauled ass and one humvee we get to a little spot a couple minutes down the road I get out of that Humvee, get thrown into another Humvee, 
And now, like, I'm starting to get, like, at first, like, I wasn't, you know, getting dizzy, queasy, or anything like that. But now, like, I'm starting, like, my head is kind of, like, starting to, to spin a little bit. My stomach is starting to turn. And I think all that adrenaline is, like, slowly starting to wear off because yep. I'm, not, I'm not in the fight anymore. So there's no need for all this adrenaline. And I'm like, man, maybe I am really boogered up because, like, I'm not feeling good at all. And uh, finally get to the hospital. Um, or actually, in, in one of the Humvees, uh, they had me laying down. Or, excuse me, on the they got me into an ambulance, and I was laying down on a gurney. And they had a they had a, a guy working on me and stuff like that. Oh, and, and when I was in the trench and the, the dude wrapped my face, they put it, it was... It was weird. So I got I got hit right right here, like right in the shoulder, right? Well, they put a tourniquet on my arm right here <laughs> and like tried to like form it up. And I was trying to tell the Ukrainians, I was like, yo, man, like that's not that's not gonna work. And he kept just working and doing his thing. I was like, whatever, dude, do your thing. Like, whatever. I'm just gonna take it off in a minute, anyways. Oh, I forgot it was on my arm because it's not actually cutting off any circulation because yeah. where it's at. So like I just forgot it was there. And uh we're in the ambulance and he sees the tourniquet and he starts like looking at my arm and I was, I was like oh this thing it's fine and I just rip it off and he's like no 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 I was, I was like it's it's fine and I was like just rip the tourniquet off and then he sees my arm he's like oh okay okay um but yeah I got to the hospital um and um uh, they uh they sewed my face up right here I'm pretty sure there's still a little bit of shrapnel in it um they kind of cleaned up my face a little bit from all the dirt and grime and blood that was all over it. And, uh, oh, I tried getting, that's what I was going to say. The ambulance guy, the, the medic that was in the ambulance, I tried to get him to take a picture. I was, I was like, I was like, Hey, take, take a picture, take a picture. And he was like, no, I was like, <laughs> dude, take a fucking picture. Yeah. And he wouldn't take a picture. So, so then like, I was like, I'm trying to take a picture in the ambulance. And I don't actually take a picture. I take a screenshot of <laughs> of me. Like it's still a, it's still me, but like you can see like the box of it trying to focus. You know, you can see like the other picture Damn. gallery and stuff like. So it's I mean it's a picture, but it's not like a good picture. Yeah. Um, that's so that's such a man thing. Take really, a picture. Take, I remember uh, like bike riding with when I was young with guys. So like, take a picture. <laughs> yeah, man. Like like I know I just got blown up, and you know I might be dying. I don't know, but. Take a picture. Yeah. It's all for the gram. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So I made it back to the hospital. They kind of cleaned me up, showed my face up, and then they, they threw me in an ambulance and, and uh then I then I had the uh the the long the long drive to Dnipro where when I got to that hospital they immediately did surgery on my eye. Um and uh I had two surgeries. The first surgery was just to I think they said fix like a crystal lens or something one i don't know anything about eyes and two there's also a language barrier so yeah. i don't know but in my head they fix something about a crystal lens in my eye okay. and then the next morning i had surgery again um that was my second surgery and that was when they uh took out the shrapnel that was in my eye and uh fixed my retina that was torn in three places Damn. yeah and what are you thinking at this point like in mm. the hospital A couple of things like one, I was like, damn, this sucks. Like, like I was like, damn, this just sucks. I was like, I'm not supposed to get hit. Like, I don't think that I'm invincible, but also at the same time, like, I don't ever think I'm going to get hit. You know what I mean? Um, and then I also was thinking, I was like, you're a fucking idiot, dude. Why didn't you have your fucking eye pro on? I was like, you always wear, like, I always wore eye pro. Even in Mink Alive, I always wore eye pro. But we ran a lot of night missions, so NVGs and thermals and stuff like that. You got, you know, your eye pro on. One, it can reflect off that lens, and then two, it also makes it harder to see in into into that yeah. that stuff. Clear eyes and that stuff sucks. Yeah, it does. So so at night, I wouldn't wear my 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 eye pro just because of the other the other equipment that I was running. And of course, this was a day mission, but just complacency of of not normally wearing eye protection i just didn't wear it so then i was thinking i was like dude you're a fucking idiot man you should have worn your fucking eye pro and then i was like damn my eye needs to hurry up and heal so i can go back and fight i was like that's all i want to do is just like go back go back and fight that's it and then i find out and then i asked the doctor after the the second surgery I was, I was like so am i gonna be able to see out of my eye again to like you know like what what's going on and the doctors were like 
you'll be able to see, but how much depends on how it heals. Right. And I was like, cool. So I'm going to be blind. Got it. Which I was never upset. I still have never been upset about losing vision in my right eye because I 100% should be dead. Like no question about it. Like a grenade going off two meters from my face, six feet from my face. I, I should be dead every day of the week. And all I got was a little bit of shrapnel in my face, some shrapnel in my arm and shoulder and lost a good portion of my vision. I'm like, all right, that works. So I'll where did that. that grenade actually come from? Inside the bunker. Oh, so they were still alive. Yeah, they were still alive. Oh. So it came out from inside the bunker. So it come come to find out they shot out. I want to. I always mess this name up. I think it's a a, a Vulcan grenade, or basically, oh. you know, you know the the Russian version of a, a of a grenade launcher. The forty mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the Russian version. I want to say it's like a 30, 30, 30 millimeter or something yeah. like that. But um, yeah, they they shot it out. And actually, my buddy. So after I left. I think he did it as I was walking out of the trench. He he jumped out and threw a grenade in that porthole that he was talking about. And uh, he, go, he goes, dude, you got out of the trench 15, 20 seconds later. I, uh, after I dropped the grenade, they surrendered. Man. And I was like, what? He, he, go, he goes, yeah. He goes, they surrendered. He goes, I also got the, um, the gun that they shot that grenade out for you, like as a souvenir. Like he goes, I couldn't, he goes, I couldn't find the grenade because, you know, you're carrying it, but I got, he goes, I got the launcher <laughs> and I was like, I was like, dude, that's fucking dope. I was like, I really, I was, I was like, what happened to that SVD? Cause there was an SVD laying on the ground and all the guys knew, like, if we ever came across an SVD, it was mine. Yeah. Like 100%. That was my SVD. And I also gotten shot at by that SVD. Cause like I said, we, we'd run a couple of uh, uh, assaults on that trench before and we got assault. We got shot at by a sniper. So I'm assuming that's the, the sniper that was shooting at us but it was right there on the floor going into that trench uh, right into that bunker so i was like what happened to that svd and he goes i don't know man nobody grabbed it and i was like fuck i was like that's cool dude you got you got my grenade you got the grenade launcher i get to keep that and he goes well i did grab it i was like all right what happened to it like sbu take it or or what and he goes no he goes i had to drop it and I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, man, we started taking heavy artillery and mortar and tank fire from the Russians, and somebody got blown up, so I, I had to drop it to, to triage them. And I was like, I guess that's fair. And he goes, yeah, dude, I ended up using my complete IFAC on him, his complete IFAC, like four tourniquets. I was like, oh, shit. And he goes, yeah, dude, this dude was banged up. I was like, well, did he live? And he goes, yeah, he lived. I was like, all right, cool. My, my, my souvenir, you know, I, I gave my souvenir away so somebody can live. I was like, whatever, that's yeah. that's cool. But yeah, that was uh so we ended up taking four there were six Russians in that in that trench. Um one of, he said he said he goes he goes, dude, there was a dude in there, you couldn't even tell it was a guy. That's how like he got blown up that much from the grenades. I was like, I I don't want to say that was my guy, but I'm pretty sure all my grenades were that. And he started laughing. He goes, dude, I think they, he thinks that the way, because I still don't know what the inside of that trench looks like. Yeah. He tells me that it goes in and kind of breaks off into two small little, not rooms, but like little dugout areas where like they can lean up into it to, for, for some protection. And he goes, I think they were using him to hide behind while you were throwing the grenades in there. Uh -huh. And then he dropped a grenade in that porthole and it landed in one of the guy's laps. So obviously he didn't make it out of there. Um, so we killed two and, and four of them surrendered. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a good day. We we successfully got that trench. And then they successfully got two or three more trenches along that tree line and stuff like that. So it was a good day. It was a good day's work. Fuck. Yeah. So how is your eye now? What, what have you got? Have you got any vision? Or? Yeah, man. I actually, I actually got a lot of vision back in my eye. Um... I mean, it's still really, really hazy, really blurry, fuzzy. Um, but like, I can see, like, I like, I can see. This is the the edge of the paper right there. It comes all the way around. That's the pin. I actually thought that was the spiral part of it, to be honest. But that's the pin. I can see my big my big circle right there. But other than that big circle right there, I can't see any of the drawings that I did. Yeah. Um, I can't see the writing on there. I can see the the dots on the bag, but that's it. I can see the blue pin cap over there. Yeah. Um, but I don't know it's a pin cap. I can just see a blue dot. I just know it's the pin cap yeah. type type deal. You Has know it what affected I mean? you much like day to day? No, no, it hasn't. I mean, um, no, not really. I mean, every now and then, um, cause like I look a lot out of my left eye now. 
obviously. Um, so every now and then, like when I'm not thinking about it, my, my right eye will start focusing. So then it'll go from like blurry, clear, blurry, clear, blurry, clear all at the same time. And like, it kind of gives my, my head a little, uh, rush. So I'm like, yeah. Whoa, all right. Like I'll close my right eye for a second, let it re refocus on my left eye. And then, uh, then I'm good on, then I'm good again. But yeah, yeah no, no, there's really been no, no day to day effect. I mean, even my driving is good. Um, every now and then, like I'll get a quick depth perception change to where like, I think it's one thing. And then as I'm getting closer to it, I'm like, Oh shit. Nope. That's not, that's, <laughs> that's not as far away as I thought it was. Um, or I'll be like, uh, I'll, I'll think it's a lot further away than, than what it is. And it ends up being a hell of a lot closer. I'm like, Ooh. Break, 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 break. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but no, it's it's been good. It's been solid. Is there any more like surgeries or anything you've done? It? So right now it's just the healing process. There's no surgeries or anything to like make it heal better or anything like that. It's just letting time do its thing. I take uh, eye drops. I'm supposed to take them three times a day, but I'll be honest, I keep forgetting about it. I take them like I take them like twice a day instead. Damn, come on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot of eye drops, man. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, these eye drops, um, I think they have like steroids and vitamins in them or something like that. But um, they, they've been helping out a lot. But yeah, my my eye guy, um, who I was completely surprised by, um, uh, an NGO really took care of me and got me like an eye doctor. He's done everything pro bono. And then if I do have another surgery, whether it's LASIK or something to heal it better or something like that, this uh, NGO is going to take care of the hospital bills and stuff like that. Yeah. That's so awesome. uh, yeah, uh, blue, blue and yellow Ukraine USA is the is the NGO, and they're they're amazing, amazing people. Awesome. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, it's just just the healing process now, letting it letting it heal, and then. Um, that was March fifteenth. We're when June eighteenth now, so we're right at three months. So probably another three months. Uh, I'll go get it evaluated again and kind of see where I'm at. Um, and my eye doctor, he was like, you know, we can do once it's completely done healing because we don't want to do anything while it's healing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, we can depending on the level of it, we can look at LASIK, we can look at glasses, you know, stuff like that. So. I'll probably never be able to see 100% out of it again, even with LASIK and stuff like that. But I mean, I'm not, even if it stays the way it is right now for the rest of my life, like I'm completely cool and content about it. Mm. That's it. Yeah. Was that the first time in that, that you've killed another man? No, I'm sure I've killed a lot of people before that. Right. If you want to talk about that. Talk uh, about like, if you, uh, yeah, just different, I mean, just different missions that we've been on. Um, you know, like there was, um, <laughs> I think it was one of the first missions I was on with this unit. Um, we uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, like escorting, like supporting missions for like the engineers and stuff like that when they went to go lay mines. And uh, we this was middle late January. Um, we went to go support some engineers while they went to go lay some mines and. Uh, it was me, Doc, and Yuri. Yuri stayed at the Humvee while we while we jumped on foot to go to go walk. And we walk about like a kilometer and a half to one point, and we're getting ready to cross this open field that's roughly like two hundred meters to another tree line to where they're gonna plant the mines on the other side of that tree line where the Russians are and they think that they're about to start moving moving that way. So while they're um Oh, I'm sorry. It was me, Doc, Yuri, and a and a, a another Ukrainian um, who was th this dude's a fucking gangster. He's part of the French Foreign Legion. Left the French Foreign Legion to come back to Ukraine to fight, and then once this war is over, he's got to go back to the French Foreign Legion to finish out his contract over there. I was like, I was like, Hectic. damn, dude. Um, I, I'd never. I'd met a couple other uh, legionnaires before then, but like I never actually like worked with a legionnaire yeah. until working with him, and he's he's a gangster. Um, but uh, but anyway, so me docking this this Ukrainian go and um, on foot, and we're waiting right before this big open open area because the commander for the engineers and our Ukrainian um, they kind of step up front to kind of evaluate the situation, you know, kind of look, you know, make sure everything's good before we, we cross through this open field. 
and they see that there's a Russian OP looking at exactly where we need to cross. So the en- the commander for the engineer scrubbed the mission. He goes, hey, no, we're not doing it. So our guy comes back to Doc and I. We're just hanging out in the snow, just just chilling, shooting the shit. And he's like, hey, guys, missions, uh, no, no, no work. Uh, we're going home. And Doc and I were, were kind of like, what? Why no mission? Like, what? What? Like, because we knew like we were going to get close to the Russians, like a good good chance that there might be some type of tick. And uh, he, he he tells us that there's an OP out there, and we're, and Doc and I are like we kind of look at each other, and he's also a Marine. Um, we kind of look at each other. We don't say anything, and before I can say anything, he looks at him and he goes, "Well, why don't the engineers leave and we kill the Russian?" And this Ukrainian, like his eyes got so big and like big old smile on his face, like huge smile. And he goes, yeah. And I was like, well, yeah, dude, let's, let's kill this motherfucker. And then, then we can get the fuck out. That way we can come run a mission some other time, you know, whatever. I was like, at least we did something while we're out here. And he's like, are y'all, are y'all sure? I'm like, yeah, dude. Like we didn't come here just to fucking hang out. Like let's work. Let's, let's kill these motherfuckers. And, uh, he's like, okay. So he runs and talks to the, the engineer commander and, uh, he, uh, um, the engineer commander was like, okay, give us, you know, 10, 15 minutes to leave. And then, uh, y'all can do what y'all need to do. So that all the, all the engineers left, all the, all all the, all the mine guys left. And and it was just us three. We kind of, we kind of got online. Doc didn't have a thermal on his rifle. He just had MVGs. So I'm letting him look through my rifle. I'm like, I'm like, all right, you see him sitting over there. He's like, yeah. And I was like, all right, cool. Get, you know, your, your, um, landmarks of where you need to shoot and everything like that. And then he starts asking me, he's like, how far do you think it is? And I don't know if you've ever tried to do unknown range estimates through a thermal at night. It's hard. Yeah. It's very hard. So I was like, man, I don't know. I'm going to say roughly 250, 300 meters, give or, give or take. He's like, all right. So he's he's that way he he knows how to aim and everything like that through his ACOG. We all get ready. You know, we, we I was like, Doc, you ready? He's like, Yeah. And I, was, I was like, Yo, you ready? He's like, Yeah. I was like, All right, three, two, one, boom, boom, boom. Shh. Yeah, we we I think we each shot off. You know, five, six rounds, something like that. Mm-hmm. I watched the the heat signature kind of like roll over, and uh, you know, wasn't really the same heat signature anymore. So we're like, All right, let's go home. So we packed up and, and left. Um, I've blown up a Russian tank with a Carl Gustav. That was fun. That was fun. Tell us about that. I uh, So this was after Doc and Yuri got blown up. Because they got blown up Christmas Eve. Or not Christmas Eve. Um, Valentine's Day. And this was a week or two afterwards. And uh, the commander, he calls me. We weren't we we weren't doing any missions because we were down a Humvee. We were down five guys, so like we've been kind of just doing some training and waiting for guys to heal up and stuff. And the commander he uh, he called me. He was like, "Hey, come to the house." So I, I come over to the house, and uh, he has a very thick, very thick accent. He speaks broken English. And uh, as I walk in the house, he's, he's like, "You shoot Carl Gustav." I was like, "Yeah, man, I've, I've shot a lot of people out here." He's, he's like, "No." Kind of smiles and he's like, "You shot Carl Gustav, or you shoot Carl Gustav?" And I was like, "Yeah, man. If you if you say I did, sure." I was like, "I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm, I'm literally You're not you know, pulling it together. Like, I'm not putting it together. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm like, f- f- how you know that I shot him is like, first of all, that's you fucking cool. I was like, that's fucking cool. Like that you know that I shot him, but like, sure. And Carl he's, Gustav doesn't sound very, very." Like Russian name, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's why I'm, I'm, I'm like, what? all right, like sure, like it's and things aren't clicking because I've never seen a Carl Gustav before. I've never shot one. I've never used one. Like I know roughly what they are, but just it's not on my frontal lobe of yeah. exactly what it is. Also, it's 100 percent out of context. It's literally just you shoot Carl Gustav, and it wasn't. It was kind of like a question, but also a statement at the same time. So he so he starts laughing after I told him I was like I was like sure if you say so like I don't I don't know who he is, yeah. and he's laughing he turns the corner and he and he and, he, and he's bringing me yeah. you know the uh, Carl Gustav, and I literally look at him I was like, oh you know like all the all the all the all the stars align you know like it all makes perfect sense now, and I was, I was like he he goes 
you shoot Carl Gustav, and now it's now it's a full question. Now I understand what he's what he's asking. I looked at him, I was like, no, I've I you know I've I've, I've never seen. I'm telling him I've never seen one. I've never touched one. I, I was like, I don't know. And he goes, uh, you shoot Carl Gustav uh, on a mission, and I was like, okay. I was like, when? He goes, one hour. I was like, one hour. I was like, and then I'm like, and then I, uh, at first we were just speaking English, and then then I, I, I start speaking Ukrainian. I'm like, just so I can clarify what he's saying. I was like, I'm shooting this on a mission in one hour. And he was like, yes. Duh. Duh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Russian. Duh. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, okay. So now I'm trying to figure out, like, how the hell am I going to learn how to shoot a Carl Gustav? Because we can't just go. I mean, we're in a small village in the middle of nowhere. And, I mean, we do shoot the 50s and the AKs and stuff like that sometimes. But I can't just shoot a, a rocket yeah, yeah. In, yeah. In, into one of our fields, you know. Um, so I'm like, how am I going to learn how to use this thing? And I was like, you know what? I know just the guy who knows how to work and operate any weapon system that's out here. Yuri. Yeah. So I, I FaceTime Yuri real quick and he doesn't answer. So I, so I shoot him a text. I'm like, yo, I need you right now. Send him the text. He FaceTimes me seconds later. He's like, what's up, dude? I was like, yo, man, uh, I'm going, going on a mission in one hour and I'm using a call Gustav. I've never done it before. I need you to give me the, the, the quick down and dirty on it because I still have to get a mission brief. I still have to, you know, give it to my guys. Still got to load up and get ready and, and push out. So I was like, I need the quick, simple yeah. on it. He's like, oh, dude, Carl Gustavs are super easy to shoot. Yeah. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, I don't see how this is easy to shoot, but go ahead and lay it on me. He's like, all right, you, you see this little this little um, latch that's right here next to the the – the, the venturi at the rear uh well no you because you have to you have to push that that slide down oh yeah, yeah yeah you have to push that slide down to your pistol grip that's what i was trying to say uh, oh goes, yeah like the the action yeah the action yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he goes he goes thumb grip it in yep yeah. yep exactly yeah he, he goes push that down and you'll hear it click and i was like all right cool and he goes now the you can t you can undo the back and I was, yeah. like, I was like all right push that in you know swings open goes, i was like all right cool perfect he goes you're gonna put your round in there and you're gonna close it and he goes make sure that the nipples are good you know everything like that and it, and it closes all the way and i was like all right cool and he goes all right and he goes your safety is right here you point and shoot i was like that's it he goes that's it i was like all right cool i was like um and he goes he goes all right now let me tell you how to work the scope on it i was like there's not a scope on this thing and he goes, the scope's in the house. So it's in our house, not the other house. I was like, shit. And I was like, all right, give me one second to run and grab the grab the scope. So I run and grab the scope real quick, slap it on the Carl Gustav, which is also really easy. It literally just slides on. Yeah. Super easy. And he goes, all right, what rounds are you using? I was like, I don't know. Whatever. A Carl <laughs> Gustav round. He, go, he goes, he goes no, nah, man, there's like eight or nine different rounds. Like, yeah. which round are you using? I was like, how do I, how do I know what round it is? He goes, what are the numbers on the round? And I start looking at it. I was like, five, five, one. He was like, all right, perfect. That's, uh, what do you say? That's your armor piercing. Heat, yeah. Or heat, yeah. Hi, yeah, it's either heat or armor. One, one of the two. And then he goes, all right, you see the scope. You see you have two little dial. He goes, you, you have a dial with like green numbers. Yeah, green, like green, green, yellow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Green. You like rotate it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. He goes, he goes, he goes all right, for, for five, five, one, you're going to need to use whatever, whatever color. Yeah. And I was like, all right, cool. And he goes, make sure you push it in or pull it out, whichever whichever line it's on, because the dial has two lines like right next to it. And if you want the inside line, you pull the knob out. If you want the outside line, you push it in. Yeah. And he goes, that's important. Make sure you get it right. And I was like, okay, cool. So you know, I slapped it in, I dialed it, and he goes, all right. However far your your target is, that's what those numbers are. It's it's and he goes, remember it's in meters. And I was like, all right, cool bet. Uh, so I was like, do I need to know anything else? And he goes, no nah, man, you're good. He goes, he goes, make sure you watch your black bass or your back blast. Yeah. Your back blast is a lot bigger than you know the oh, RPGs yeah. and the AT fours oh, that we've yeah. been, that we've been shooting. It'll and kill you within like fifty meters. Yeah. 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 He goes. He goes. He goes. Make sure your back blast is clear. I was like. I was like. Got it. I was like. Cool. I now roughly know how to shoot a Carl Gustav. So we go to. Um, 
this trench that we we've been operating out of doing doing some work and we haven't been able to sexually successfully do the work because there's been tanks in the area supporting the other the russian trenches and this one tank just happened to be in a half ash shooting position to where we can to where we can possibly get it and who else better to shoot at this tank at a half ass position that's never shot a rocket at that distance before me like who else yeah. so i grab a grab a few uh because uh, they're in the the two little it's a case and two 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 rounds to a case yeah. looks like a jet pack kind that's of exactly yeah. what it looks like a little yeah. jet pack yeah. that's exactly what it looks like and um so we're we were in this trench and then to be able to shoot the tank we had to go to this other it's a really big trench system but they're just using it as an op so there's only like a couple guys in it um so we go to this trench and like way across this field, and it was like 800 meters away, give or, give or take a little bit. Um, I can just see like this small speck in the tree line. And there's other Russian tanks that are already blown up. Like I think there was three three other Russian tanks in, in that wow. same vicinity that were already blown up. So I'm sitting there talking to, you know, to my to my point man. I'm like, all right, man, where where is it? He goes, you know, he's guiding me on. I'm like, all right, cool. I see that tank. He goes, not that tank. I was like, that's the tank you just said. He goes, he goes, no, that one's blown up. Don't shoot that one. I was like, got it. And he goes, next to it. I'm like, dude, there's nothing next to it. And he goes, and then he he's like, he's like, it's very small. And then he goes, it's just the black dot that's right there in the tree line. And I was like, ah. He goes, you see it? And I was like, no. And he goes, he goes, and like I can see him getting frustrated because like I just, I'm just not seeing it. I don't. And then he, he pulls out his phone and he has a picture of it on his phone <laughs> from the drone. And he goes, here. And I was like, oh, it's right. They're using this tank that's blown up to cover up this tank. So literally just it was a, just a, a small portion of this tank was sticking out from that tank. That's why I thought he was pointing at that tank. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I got it. And he goes, you got it? I was like, I got it. We're good. So I load the first round in. And, you know, set, set my scope for 800 meters. And, uh, I was like, all right, fire in the hole. Made sure I made sure my ear pro was in, you know, cause yeah. I, he was talking about how big the black blast was. So I was yeah. like, I was like, this thing's gotta be fucking loud. And I also forgot this thing was recoilless at the time. I completely forgot it was recoilless. So like, I'm sitting there, like I'm, I'm bracing, like I'm, <laughs> like I'm waiting for, yeah. you know, a, 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 a kick from hell, like a recoil from hell for this thing. And um, I shoot it, no recoil. It was loud as all get out. Even it's with a weird ear, feeling it too, was isn't a, it? it was it was. A, it's the percussion. It's like yeah, a, yeah. That's yeah. exactly. That's all you feel is just there's just the the energy leave the tube is what really kind of what you feel. And um, I'm watching my my smoke trail, and I'm I'm watching it. I'm watching it. And it goes way over the tank. I was like, ah oh, shit. So I jump down, drop another round into uh, into it get up there and like now i'm trying to be quick i was like is if i can see my smoke trail they can see my smoke trail mm -hmm. and i was like the last thing i need is this tank to start shooting at me while i'm out of the trench so i shoot again and i'm watching my smoke trail and it's looking good it's looking good and it skimmed right over the top of the the turret and i was like oh you gotta be kidding me i'm just giving these guys all day to start shooting at me mm -hmm. so i jump down again get another round jump back up and now i'm just praying i'm like please don't shoot me because i can't see if he's facing me i can't i can't see anything yeah i can just see this black blob and i i'm, I'm like i'm like and now i'm shooting because the the second time i shot lower and i still went over a little bit and i was like all right i'm gonna shoot even lower so now i'm aiming at like the ground right where his tracks are and uh i shoot again and i'm like please hit please hit please hit and all of a sudden i I hear, you know, the metal on metal, and then I hear, uh, and then I see, like, sparks, you know, kind of go up in the air, and I'm like, boom, like, that's it, got him. And I was, like, ex super excited and, like, happy. At the same time, I was also very unimpressed and disappointed because they don't blow up like I thought they do. Mm. They don't blow up like they do on movies no. where the turret flies in the air and, like, there's this huge fireball and ammunition starts cooking off everywhere it didn't do that didn't cook no no i mean there was there was a good like smoke cloud like 
afterwards um after we like started like packing things up and like pushing out um like i could see like you know smoke in the air and stuff like that yeah. but it wasn't like the big fireball like was i thought it, it was going to be was it, was it manned it wasn't abandoned um i i i think it was manned yeah. because i mean they'd been using it to support the other elements and like there was there's a russian trench right there where uh where it was at because we've taken um we got we got we've taken good good amount of small and heavy heavy arms fire from that position um so it was possible yeah. it was possibly mm -hmm. possible i would i i'm thinking it was manned i would like to think it was manned that i just you know i take it as man that's what i'm taking it like I, I destroyed a russian tank and what four four crew guys sure mm -hmm. that's what i say it was it was fun it was fun and then we immediately probably like two or three minutes later started getting some really really direct artillery fire <laughs> they were not happy about it they were not happy about their tank getting blown up um but yeah packed up and went home literally just there to blow up a tank and that was that was our mission went home yeah and how, how's your feeling after something like that like oh dude i was excited like i was i was like high all day for the rest of the day like that was that morning and like for the rest of the day like i was on a high like a walking on cloud nine that i just blew this tank up got it on video and everything i just blew this tank up it was all the all the ukrainians were really happy you know even even as i was walking through the the trenches they, they would ask me like did, did you get it did you get it and i just kind of give them a thumbs up and they're all like yeah was, have you had any like since like you've come back from the war any like feelings of like oh shit like you know like almost empathy towards other humans yeah so actually even even before I came uh, all the way back to the states. Like I was, I was living with a friend of mine in, in Lviv um, and her family um, while I was waiting for the NGO to be able to get, you know, my, uh, one my my discharge paperwork from my unit and everything like that, and then they were getting my flight and everything back to the states. She and I had a lot of a lot of conversations, and I don't fault her or family or any any Ukrainians for the way they think um, about Russians um, because of what the Russian people are doing and have been doing to the civilians of, of Ukraine. But she and I got into a, a pretty, pretty deep conversation one time and kind of, kind of an argument, but, uh, um, cause I was telling her, I was, I was like, you know, I, I feel bad for the Russian soldiers and, uh, or the, some, some of the Russian soldiers, but the, but mostly the, the families of the soldiers. And she was like, what? No, you know, I don't feel sorry for them at all. You know, da, 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 da. she's like, how could you feel sorry for them? I was like, the families are innocent. Mm. Like the Russian families are innocent. Yeah. You know, they might believe the propaganda, you know, they might agree that, you know, they're denazifying Ukraine and cool. Sure. Whatever. But at the end of the day, they lost a husband, a brother, a son. And, and she was like, she was, she was going on and on and on. And I was like, look, I was like, I've killed a good amount of people out here. I have made people that didn't deserve the pain that I put on them. I was like, I was like, I secondhand inflicted a lot of pain on, on families that didn't do anything to me. Now, I don't feel bad for the soldiers that I killed. Those guys, you know, fuck them, whatever. You know, they, yeah, they might have just been doing what they were told and they didn't want to be there to begin with, but... At the end of the day, I got a job to do just like you got a job to do. So I don't I don't feel I don't feel bad for you. But the families of the of of those soldiers. Yeah, you know, I I, I feel I, I feel bad for them, you know, because I know what it's like to lose family members. You know, I, I know what it's like to to lose, you know, uh, uh, brothers that I fought with and stuff like that. And it's a shitty feeling. So I do have empathy towards um, the innocent people on on both sides of the of the conflict um and and so so yeah i would i would i would agree yes i would yeah. i would say yeah yeah and have you, have you dealt with that um i don't think i have really i mean i just kind of just you know just just one thing you got to live with you know just i don't really think there is something a, a way to deal with it you just say you know what is what it is move on with it you know yeah. kind of because i I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how, how, how would you deal with it? I mean, I really, I really don't know. You know, I mean, uh, I've had PTSD before. I mean, I have it now again, obviously. Um, 
and I did go see a therapist and a psychiatrist and stuff like that. And that worked wonders. Um, but it's also made me be able to think the way I think now and everything and be able to process and compartmentalize and, and, and do different things now. And, um, but yeah, to me, it's just, uh, just one of those things, you know, I'll, I'll think about it for a few minutes and it's not even every day. It's, you know, every now and then, you know, I'll think about it and I'm like, mm. all right, well, next. Yeah. Yeah. How was it when you first killed someone? Honestly, I don't think I thought about it. So, yeah, okay. Well, I've spoken saying, to a few people and like the, the sense of loss of innocence, but... I don't think I thought about it. Mm. Um, like I said, like I'm really good at compartmental... Compartment, however you say That word. That words are hard, man. They words are, are, <laughs> words are Trust hard. Trust me, they are. <laughs> Everyone who listens to me, they're like, you're an idiot. I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what I tell people all the time. Like, uh, I'll be saying stuff. Um, also like with my TBI, like, uh, I'll forget things like mid sentence or I'll start stuttering really, really hard. And I'll just like, yeah, well, I'm ret- so, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. it is what it is. But yeah, words are hard sometimes. Um, but yeah, I don't, uh, I really just kind of chalk it up to, uh, it's work. Mm-hmm. I knew what I was signing up for when I, when I chose to do it. Um, if I didn't do it, Either one, it'd be me in a box or one of my boys in a box. So I just, it just, I don't, I don't think I would say I lost my innocence. Um, I just, just something, something that needed to be done and I'm good at doing it. So I got it done mm. type deal. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't expecting an answer. I just, oh. yeah, I just. Yeah. yeah, it's just. Yeah, I think it's just interesting to break that down. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's definitely. It's definitely interesting to think about sometimes. Because like I'll think about things sometimes, just like run different missions over in my head and like kind of do like after action reports in my own head months later on a mission. Mm-hmm. Like, man, we should have done this. We should have done that. You know. You know. We could have done this better. Um, you know. That was great. That's a great thing that we did. You know. Different things like that. And then, but I, I don't think I ever once think about how I felt after killing somebody because that's what the way i chalk it up is if i didn't do that then i really don't even think about it me me dying i always think about one of my boys getting hurt that's what i think about i'm like if i didn't do this he wouldn't have gone home you know we wouldn't have been able to fucking grab pizza on the way back to the house together you know that's what i think about yeah yeah so that's that's why i chalk it up how is it fighting against the Russians? There's this common sort of idea that they're very um, incompetent. They don't know what they're doing. Human waves, things like that. How truthful is that? Or is it? Man, it's... So when I first went over there to go fight, all I've ever known is, you know, Russia is like our number one... Adversary. Yeah, adversary. Them, them in China, but it, mm-hmm. everyone leans more towards Russia also because, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, everything like that. Like, if we ever go to war, the last country we want to go war with is Russia because it's going to be like fighting ourselves. Yeah. So that's the mindset I had going into it. And then the longer, you know, we went on missions and did different things and I was able to see their stuff, I was like, man, these guys, these guys suck. Mm-hmm. These guys suck. Like, the only thing that they have is the fact that, one, they're in, tr- in an entrenched position, so it's harder to assault it, and, two, that they have an unlimited number of bodies. Yeah. Literally, unlimited number of bodies. Um, and I never experienced it firsthand, but I've literally seen videos from other guys and other guys that I know personally, they would tell me stories that in the Bakhmut area that they were literally just waves. Like, well, what do you mean waves in it? And one guy broke it down. He goes, you know, in Call of Duty, when you're playing zombies and it's just a horde after a horde after a horde, and then the bodies will start piling up and you got to like shoot rockets into the pot, pot, yeah. pile of bodies to, to disperse it so you can keep yeah. shooting the zombies. I was like, yeah. And he goes, that's what we were doing. Yeah. I literally looked at him. I was like, so you shot RPGs and stuff at piles of bodies. And I can like, when I'm trying to break it down like this dude, like he was... Like I messed up in the head, but like he is, he's gonna be hurt, hating life for the rest of his he's life. Not like a small Spanish speaker. No, no, no he's, he's a guy no, he, told me in a bar in Kiev, a fighter told me almost the same. He's like, oh yeah, really? Well, but this is very early in the war. This would have been shit, 
July 22. Oh. And he was like, yeah, we were in a position, waves of men, and we were shooting, shooting, shooting. But there was that many bodies piling up. We had to then shoot anti-armor munitions into, to break up the, because it was creating dead zones. Yeah. It was creating zones of fire mm-hmm. that they could use as cover. Yeah, that's what that's uh, what yeah. he was saying. There's a scene in the, in the Pacific, the same as well. Yep. Yeah. 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 He was, and, and at first I thought he was just like being like exaggerating a little bit um, and embellishing the story a little bit. And then like when I asked that question, I looked at him, I was, I was like, so you would shoot rockets at just mounds of dead Russians to, to, to break it up. And like just the way he looked at me and he was like, yeah, I was like, oh shit. Like it is way worse over there than like, I thought it was bad in the, you know, the, the next area that we were fighting, but he was fighting in Bakhmut, and I was like, holy shit. Uh, so I never experienced that extreme of just wave and wave and wave. Um, but clear, obviously, I mean, you've heard a similar story and way before I heard this story. Um, so it, it is it is true that that's exactly what they're doing. And I have seen them do waves and waves. Um, but then there's also units that are, are squared away, like the mission that uh, Yuri and Doc got blown up with the Cornet missile. Um that was supposed to be a quick, easy mission. We, he and I were jump uh, uh, in the turrets of our fifties. He and I were both supposed to, you know, blast five hundred rounds, five seven hundred rounds into the the Russian position, and then just gather intel on, you know, their reaction, how long it took, you know, for for them to call in support and X, Y, and Z. And unfortunately, my fifty went down. Um, within like 10 rounds and, and, and busted. So we pulled out, but we were only, we were only on site at this point, maybe two minutes, three minutes tops. He was finishing up. I want to say like his last, his last ammo can, maybe second to last ammo can. And they shot a Cornet missile effectively and, and blew up their Humvee. And, and how I think the only reason that they all lived, uh, even though doc got, banged up the most um the only reason why that they all lived is because the the cornet missile hit the the berm right next to them i mean it still blew the humvee up and blew them up but it wasn't a direct hit and that's the only reason why they lived um so you i mean you have you have two 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 areas you know you have the the russians that are literally just waves and waves and then you got guys that know what they're doing and you know they they responded to that to that you know um to that contact fairly quickly and accurately yeah um so i mean it's i've experienced both both sides of it and then i've yeah. also experienced you know when we've when we were assaulting a trench um we took some very accurate um very accurate and heavy small arms fire um so i mean it it really depends on what what unit we're going against do i think any of them are um as skilled as you know the u.s or some of the nato countries no no i don't i think the only thing that russia really has going for them is the fact that they are dug in positions you know and and some of their positions i mean they've been holding for the last nine years so they're really dug in and and really well fortified but two they just have literally an unlimited number of bodies I would, yeah. That's that's what I would say. Yeah. That's that's the only thing Russia has going for them, and that that's the answer most people give me is there's units that are at the absolute extremes. Mm-hmm. That every American infantry unit is pretty good, and, and all like there's going to be better units and worse units, but you know they're all pretty capable. They all they all have at least this standard. Yeah, they've right all here. got that standard. Right. Where in the Russians you've got legitimate tier one, tier two units, mm-hmm. and these guys who have no idea and a lot of people talk about that's the way things are set up because it's like funded through the area not fund like the u.s or australian military is federally funded Mm -hmm. and then dispersed out of the units where the funding there works differently it's like no this town's rich so they've got good units this town's poor that unit sucks Uh, and things like that yeah the the next question i was going to have for you is is there anything the russians are good at and one of the main things that i hear is the artillery that the artillery, by quality, isn't an M777 with 155, but by quantity, is just fucking insane. Yeah, I'll say the Russians are really, really good at committing war crimes. Can you tell us about some of that? I mean, I had white phosphorus dropped on me. White phosphorus, <laughs> that's, but that's a... 
that's a grey zone of, it, of uh, because you know it is it is a it is a, it is a gray zone. Munitions are allowed to be used against not okay sorry against non civil targets. US did it, Syria, Iraq. That's <laughs> like I'm not gonna you're I'm not gonna say that one side is right and one side is wrong on the thing. Um because you you are right. Technically it is an incendiary round and incendiary rounds are allowed to be used. Um so it is a very gray, gray area. Um but uh Yeah, man, there's 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 villages that literally the whole houses are shot up. Like before there was ever even like Ukrainian combat units in there. They were just shot up by Russian units, by Russians just walking through the street, just like shooting into houses just because they were drunk and just wanting to have fun and just shooting into houses and shit. Um, you know, it's still controversial on who blew the dam up, but it's, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out who blew the dam up. Um, you know, just different different things like that. You know, shooting rockets into um, stores, supermarkets, schools, um, where there's zero military units in the area. Not even just like, hey, this unit, this military unit uses this store for their commissary and stuff like that. So that's why we're going to shoot it. No, there's literally no military in the village or town itself, and these places are getting blown up. Um, so there's that. Um, but actual like fighting wise, is there something they're good at? Yeah, man, I'd probably, I'd probably agree with the artillery. Um, most of it is not necessarily accurate, but you don't really have to be that accurate when you're just unloading a shit ton of it. Yeah. Cause eventually you're going to, you're going to get lucky. Yeah. Uh, eventually you're going to get lucky. So if I'm trying to hit this area and I know my, 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 my aim isn't the best, I'm just going to flood it with everything because I'm going to get everything around it, which I'm going to hit good, good key targets. Also, I'm going to get military, you know, equipment, men, stuff like that. But also one of my rounds are going to get lucky and, and, and hit there also. Yeah. So yeah, I would, I would agree with the, the artillery statement. 100%. Is there, is there anything you've seen on your side of the fence being the foreign legion, Ukraine side of the fence that sat uneasy with you as well? I've heard a lot of a lot of bad things about the the International Legion. I was never a part of the Interla International Legion, so I I can never speak firsthand experiences on that, and I and I won't speak any, about any any experiences because I don't pers yeah. personally know about it. It's all hearsay, and like I said earlier, you know, people try to compare the uh, uh, Ukrainian military to whatever country they're from military, mm -hmm. and that's why most of their hate and discontent comes from. Um, but yeah, uh, the first unit that I was with in Mykolaiv, man, we never got we never got a single mission brief, not a single mission brief. Um, there was no after actions. There was nothing. There was a shit ton of suicide missions, like walking through a minefield at night. You know, like the commander, like we we told the commander no. He was wanting us to go through it, and we're the ones that said absolutely not. We're not doing it. Um, but just stupid shit like that, you know, just constantly sitting. Uh, there was there was uh, a mission in Mykolaiv that we ran the same mission every day for like four or five days. The exact same mission. The exact same way. And we're like, hey, man, if it didn't work the first time, cool. Maybe try it a second time in a few days, a week, or something like that. Let them, you know, settle back down, calm down, get, get relaxed, and, you know, take them by surprise again. But when you're doing the exact same thing over and over and over again, that's, that's easy for them. Yeah. They're, they're just going to be sitting waiting for us to, to, to walk down that tree line again. As soon as they hear a twig snap, they already know who it is and what we're there to do. Mm -hmm. So they're just going to light it up. So, so yeah, the, 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 the first unit I was with that commander, he was horrendous and we tried to try to do something about it, but the higher ups, they, they were like, no, he's a very smart man. He was a um, an accountant, environmentalist. He was he was something, something smart. Like like you had to be smart to have his job. Yeah. He he was a very he's a very smart man. He was he was this before the war, so he's he's good. And when when he said that, I looked at him. I was like, 
yeah, well, I'm really good at jacking off, but that doesn't mean I'm really good at having sex. Yeah. And, and, and of course, the, the Ukrainian, he, he kind of laughed. And I was like, but it's true, though. I was like, just, you know, I can be really good at war, but I can be a horrible accountant. Yeah. Just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean you're going to be good at another. And they're like, well, you know, he, he's the commander and this is how it's going to stay. Yeah. I'm like, whatever. So, But that's a hangover from the Soviet system, too. It is. It's where your social standing is off things like your education, mm-hmm. whatever, where, mm-hmm. and even just the family are born in. And there's a hangover of this as well. Yeah. That, you know, the Soviet Union was only 30 years ago. Exactly. There's a hangover of this that I, I, a lot of people tell me about is that you were put in an officer position just because you are a Williams or just because you are uh, a accountant or an engineer. Mm-hmm. Yep. You're in that position. It's really interesting. Um, there's this guy called Jack Barsky. He's on the Lex Friedman podcast. He was a defector KGB spy. Oh, wow. Really interesting guy because he was like legit KGB and then defected and now it's just like spilled that'd be, beans. That'd it's be awesome. cool to talk to. Um, yeah, it's awesome. But he talks about this that like in the Soviet Union when you've got like ultimate communism, socialism, whatever, it's just the same thing repackaged. Yeah. Um, that the only way to get ahead is by like social standing and that's why he was like, I need to be an engineer, whatever of that. But the Russians still have that sort of system too and you see the hangover of it from the you do from ukraine too but you you see the russians it's like this officer he's just an officer because he's from here and you're yeah like, but do you have any idea of the fox and you know truthfully in the western militaries we're still not that far away from that like the officers in the army are still from richer families yep they're still from better educated backgrounds yep. and there there is a fucking difference yep. you know you look at you look at a normal infantry unit, say, and you're like, hang on, my sergeant has done 18 years and 10 trips overseas. This guy has done 18 months at ROTC, or if you call it, and he's in charge. And he's from some rich private school. Yeah, exactly. Because the score to get into officer training is fucking hot. And it's it is like high. the education level may be very expensive. Like it might be free to do, but the score's very high. Mm-hmm. So if you already have the... Um, uh, the qualification you can get in, but it's like, but that's exp- it. It does peel out. Guys like you and I, yeah, could not have been officers. No, absolutely not. Yeah, and same with the sergeants and shit. So there's definitely that in our own system as well. No, the, the, it, you're you're 100 percent right. It, we we do have it in our system as well. Uh, I just don't think it's as bad no, no. as as it is. And I will say, from my time fighting in, because I I fought in Mikulov from um end of july to end of september and then i came back to the states for a couple months to try to uh to go back to our military and do some stuff um and that didn't work out so that's why i went back over there and um i did see a difference one within two different units um but also like when i would work with other units and stuff like that like i could see how I knew this unit was before and how they are now. So like the, I, I do, I did witness and, and saw firsthand the, the progression yeah. uh, of knowledge and they are trying to change it, but there is still, you know, there's that, that overhanging effect. I mean, cause just, just like you said, you know, Soviet Union was only 30 years ago. Um, so I mean, people, I mean, I'm 20, I'm 28. So uh, I'd have been born right after the collapse, which means my parents grew up and know only Soviet Union. So even though I didn't grow up in the Soviet Union, I still grew up in the Soviet Union because all the adults that I grow up under are Soviet mindset of people. So it takes generations to break down all that stuff. But I will say with, uh, um, with this war, um, and just the influx of, of knowledge and aid and support from other countries, it is, I think, helping expedite and speed that process up because that's actually um it was it was actually really cool i talked to this guy a lot he when i was running the um the training facility in lviv the first time i was out there i had a guy he was he's an old man he was probably he was probably in his 70s he was in the soviet army right yeah yeah and i was like as soon as i found out i was, I was like man this dude is old what is he doing here and so i was like hey man that dude's legit. He was in the Soviet army. And as soon as they said that, I was, I thought two things. I was like, one, that's fucking cool. I got to talk to this guy. Yeah. And then two, I was like, this dude's going to be a fucking nightmare to train. Mm. Probably the best dude I trained. Really? Out of all the students out there. He was picking stuff up quick. He was wanting to learn it. He was asking questions. He was engaged. And, and then after he got something 
you know, down pat, he would see somebody else struggling and he would help them. And, and, you know, I didn't have to have a translator. Like he would immediately just start, you know, doing, doing his thing. Um, but he was a cool, interesting guy to, to guy to talk to. Yeah. 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 I, I had a guy similar, I had a fixer in Kramatorsk actually, mm-hmm. or out of Kramatorsk. And he and I got told you very limited English, but he was like, are you, are you a military? I was like, yes. He's like, did you serve? I'm like, oh, Afghanistan. He's like, me too. Your pussies. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking fair chop. Fair. Like, fair, fair call. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> fucking got me, son. <laughs> I'm just going to sit down and shut up because you're not wrong. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I'll take that. But, <laughs> yeah, no, I was like, oh, I... Because there's actually, in the centre of Kram- Kramatorsk, there's a um, war memorial to Afghanistan. Oh, Because wow. that's where, how we got onto that talk. Because mm. he's like, yeah, yeah, I, I was with those guys. I was like, fuck. Wow. Like, Wow, like that's very fucking interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. That's cool. That's one thing I man, I really love about Ukraine is, is because uh, like I think there's like, you know, history here in America, you know, like old history and stuff like that, but it never, it, it doesn't equate to the type of history that's over on, you know, in Europe and Eastern Europe and stuff like that because, yeah. well, one, America's not that old um, uh, compared to these countries. But uh, um, two, just like, America also hasn't been in the kind of conflicts and engagements and, and just and internal turmoil too. Yeah, that that these countries have been in. So mm-hmm. so getting to to talk and talk to these people and then like see different because I mean there's still Soviet um, statues oh, there's and mosaics everywhere. everywhere. There's like hammer and sickles on buildings. Yeah, like, yeah. The Soviet Union is fucking interesting. It is. It really like, is. Because it's like a whole different top part of humanity. Mm-hmm. But like that whole region, the history, you know why they call them Ruskies? Mm-mm. Was at one point back fucking, I don't know how long ago, it's when the Vikings landed in like northern, northern Russia. Now, what? Like, yeah, it's, it's just wild, man. It is wild. The history is, uh, the history and literature. One thing I do really dislike about all conflict, actually, and even political conflict within countries, is when we try and delete history. Yeah, pulling I agree. down war memorials, pulling down statues, I hate it. I, and I'm like, hey, even if we like that guy's a prick, I just don't. I, I still don't agree. With, like, like, same as me, it really sits uneasy with me pulling down like Soviet memorials. Yeah, because I'm like, hang on, okay, what's happening now? Shocking, but they they're still just guys who are fighting. On our side back then, mm-hmm. like what, yeah. like you know, and I'm a big believer in if you know um, those who forget history are bound to repeat it. I'm That's a, a fact, I, and I'm a big believer in like, hey, that hammer and sickle we should look at and go, that's fucking evil. That's mm-hmm. how we should see it. But now what we're seeing in more liberal areas is people with liberal values having like a hammer and sickle, and oh, this was and you're like, this is the absolute entrenched of. You're forgetting history. Forgetting what if, this really is. If you remembered what that hammer and sickle means, if you know, there's the Victorian Socialism Party in Australia, and it's like, if you actually, and they identify, they'll quote like Lenin and Stalin. Oh, and wow. I'm sickened. I'm like, you don't understand what this is because this isn't taught, and we're trying to delete this history. Yeah. And you see it the same on the alt right too. Yeah. They don't actually understand what Nazism was. Mm-hmm. But. Oh, I see this as well with Russia, The um, that everything was bad. And you're like, no, no, no. If, you, if you read like literature from like um, Dostoevsky back 150 years ago, that stuff's brilliant. Yeah. Like um, many will say like so far ahead of the time. That it doesn't just, it, we should we need to look on this era as shocking and whatever. Right. But like you said, with just the average mum and dad who lost their son at war, you know, there still needs to be some like, hey, yeah, just on a just on a, 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 a basic humanitarian level, just a basic human level. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter whether I agree with their political views, their what they like to do for leisure on the weekends. You know, it doesn't matter anything like that. They still lost somebody that they loved dearly, mm. and I'm the reason for that mm. pain and suffering on them. Mm. Like, yeah, it's a, you know it's. It's shitty. I mean, it is. Um, but I agree with you. I think I think that a lot of people they um, dive too much into their their hatred for things. Um, 
are discontent for things, and then um, they just want to they they hate something so much they want to completely act like it never happened, get rid of it, erase it. Mm. Well, if we do that, then everybody's going to forget about all of this stuff. So then when somebody says, hey, I got a great idea, let's do this, and then they get a small following, and then turns out this guy actually had an ulterior motive and starts repeating all this stuff that we just covered up. They just throw a different name on it, or they throw a different emblem on it. It's the same thing. Yeah. And we would know about it. We'd be able to see the signs if we didn't cover all of this up. I was like here in America a, a, a few years ago, they started taking down um, all kinds of uh, um, Confederate statues. Mm-hmm. And like in Dallas, there was a, there's, there's a park in Dallas, Robert E. Lee Park. And there's a Robert E. Lee statue. Yes. He fought, you know, in, in the, in the civil war, you know, and you know, there's all these bad things, but he also, you got to think about it, He also did a lot of good things for the area that he was, that, that he was fighting for and the things that he was fighting for. And like, you can't have my biggest thing is you can't have all the, the positives and all the good stuff without the bad oh, no. and to be able to appreciate all the good and, and everything that we have now, you also have to be able to appreciate mm. the bad or maybe not appreciate, but you have to, you have to understand and see and under, uh, uh, how we got what we got now. Yeah. And, a lot of people are just like, no, this was bad. We need yeah. to, we need to erase it. Never, never, never see it again. You can't just pick and choose. You can't. It's history. Mm-hmm. It's going to exist, or it'll pop up again. Exactly. And that's the danger. And I, I know we're getting a bit sidetracked, but I honestly <laughs> believe we're seeing little bits and pieces like this pop up again. Oh, you know? all over the world. And, and and we're starting to see it. And I think, is there some responsibility of, hey, we're seeing then this um, grand idea of the Soviet Union pop up again? In the eyes of the Kremlin, mm-hmm. where but then influencing other people, and you're like, is that because we forgot how fucking horrible that was? We for, like these people who are very pro-Russian in America. And there's a fucking lot. There's like, a lot honestly, of them. It's 50 Yeah, like people don't people don't say this, but I honestly believe fifty fifty. Um, at least at least from what like maybe not fifty fifty, but like of hardcore. Yeah, like there's a lot of very hardcore people, and it's like, is this just because? we've forgotten about this because we've tried to erase that. Like, Mm -hmm. hey, don't do that. Like, if if people should see the signs go, hey, Putin's spilling stuff that Stalin was spilling, or whatever, hey, we should have seen this 10 years ago. Exactly. And my my biggest thing on this war, and where I think a lot of, the responsibility for the war, of course, lays with the Kremlin and Putin. Oh, yeah. Of course, there's no argument. There's, there's, yeah, exactly. But I also think, we have a lot to answer for as far as if guys like me, like I went to Ukraine before the war mm-hmm. because I thought there was going to be a major fucking war. Mm-hmm. The CIA, these things should have seen this. Yeah. Ten, well, it, there's no excuse post-14 for that, the that, that, annexation of Crimea and Donetsk. Like the, the first invasion that most will say never ended because they never pulled back. Correct. That this was just the second stage of the that second invasion. stage, yeah. That there's no excuse to not have that eight nine years. Yeah, that's why I don't say to whenever. Have an arm. Yeah, that's when everyone everyone's saying you know oh Russia invaded you know February twenty fourth. No, no, they they invaded in twenty fourteen. They did a mass expansion February twenty two. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I I completely agree with you. They should have never the the Western world, especially you know with. MI6, CIA, I don't know what Australia has. I'm sure they have something. Yeah, ISIS, uh, secret intelligence. Yeah, yeah. With, with, yeah. All these, with all these countries, they all knew Russia was planning something. Mm-hmm. And I believe Intel came out that they had it within, you know, a couple of days or a week. Yeah. yeah. There's no reason that this should have been allowed to happen. Zero. Yeah. But yeah. I think, I think, because I'm a firm believer in if you have the um, ability to help somebody, you have the responsibility to help somebody. Mm-hmm. To include on a government standpoint. Yep. To include on a government standpoint. All, all, of, all of the Western world government had the means, knowledge, and everything to support and stop what was going on. Mm-hmm. They had a responsibility and they failed to do so. Well, I, I'd actually take it a step further. If not only they have responsibility, they had um, security guarantees signed. 
Yeah, that's what and a lot of people this forget is what about. Disappoints me, and with American politics, now I think American politics is fucking toxic, no oh, matter the side. Yes. Um, but the Clinton government signed with the D. Um, the armament of the nuclear weapons. Yep. But no, people talk about the nukes in Ukraine. It wasn't just the nukes. It was the supersonic bombers too. Yep. So the, the TU aircraft, those sort of aircraft that they got taken. And there's a lot of other things, landmines, rocket fuels, things like that. There's a lot in this. There was a lot. But the Russians, the Belarusians, the UK and the US signed peace deals. So yep. if the US went to take Ukraine, then Russia would go no and defend them. Correct. And vice versa. And you're correct. Which, you know, is what it was. And... I think there was. I think there's also bits we broke pre the um, thing as well. But mm-hmm. I'm like, how serious was it? I'm, I'm not willing to speak on that. But then I was like, well, what? Now many people say we are upholding our end of it. But I'm like, see, I, and and I, but to I, what degree? Like this wasn't so, like it may be upholding it by the terms you've written ex- in legal terms. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. But, they, they're sitting there dissecting it, and I'm like, okay, yes, technically. Per black and white, we are helping defend Ukraine. Cool, but there's also there's there's a thing called you know um, here here in the states you know letter of the law, spirit of the law. Yeah. Letter the letter states we will help defend. Cool, yep. that's what we're doing. The spirit was completely different when it was written. Yeah. Meaning we will be there for you. Yes. And we will help. Stand side by side. Granted, that's not written in words that we're going to put boots on the ground, but we all know if you read it, that's what it means. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what it was meant to be. Mm-hmm. That if Belarus come in, then we'll go, hey, no, we'll come and kick them out. And the same, that if we came in, Belarus and Russia, and rightfully so, if right. we went into Ukraine without you know, an invitation to take this land mm-hmm. the opposite way, the other countries should come and go, fuck off. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. I have a friend of mine, I won't name him by name, but he's super pro-Ukrainian, like raising money, doing all like, you know, everything. That's awesome. Everything but fighting. He's also a soldier. Um, but he's like, um, we were born, uh, so he's soldier, Western soldier. Um, but he's like, in Syria, we're on the wrong side. Now, yeah. I don't know enough about that war. I've been with the Syrian rebels and I've got a fucking, I've got photos with the rebels there. That's dope. And I don't know that much actually though about the war, but he was like, we should be able to see where we're wrong, where other countries are wrong. And mm-hmm. he's like, this is clearly Russia wrong. And he said, but this, we're wrong there. And yeah. he said, the thing is, he's like, I find it really hard because he's Syrian born. Oh, wow. Um, fought Western military and whatever. And now he's doing everything for Ukraine. But he's like, I find it really hard to be super um, anti-Russian here. But in Syria, I'm like, we're on the wrong side and they're yeah. on the right side. But I'm like, yeah, but that is critical thinking. That's mm-hmm. critical thinking and going, hey, because it should also be able to say we we were the pr- we were the pricks in Iraq. We were. Um, we should have. We should have never been. There yeah. was. Th- there was no uh, WMDs. It was all. It was a lie. It was all a lie between between governments. Um, that way they could get in there and do do what they want on a government mm-hmm. standpoint, and the the, the civilian population uh, and and the western the western world governments mm-hmm. uh, or in the western world we ate up what the government was feeding us. Yeah. Um, but what's funny is there's still people that support the fact that we should have been in Iraq and Afghanistan for the 20 years that we were in there, but are die hard against sending aid, not even sending, obviously we're not sending men over there because they would be really against that, but they're just against the simple fact of we're sending military equipment mm-hmm. that doesn't affect our day-to-day pocketbook here. Yeah. It's all outdated equipment that we're not using. Mm-hmm. It's making it to our, our defense budget is, yeah, we're, we're spending our defense budget, but it's also going to grow our defense budget because yeah. it's gonna now going to make it to where we have to get new equipment. Yeah. So that's putting more money back into the economy. Yeah. But people don't think of it that way. Yeah. They think of it as, oh, we just spent, you know, $3 billion to a corrupt company or a corrupt country that uh, is giving Biden bribes somewhere, somehow. Yeah. I don't, I've yet to see any... any <sighs> conversation on the bribe that's a, that's a whole nother yeah. topic yeah. but um but but yeah man like i i completely agree with with that it's uh uh it it, it should be very clear who is right and who is wrong in this situation and um a lot of peace deals are being broken because they want to go by the letter of the peace treaty yeah. versus the spirit of the peace treaty mm-hmm. um 
Like it's I, sad. I, I also don't agree with, at this point, rolling soldiers in because the last thing we need is further escalation. But yeah. I think, you know, what we should have seen that this was broken in 14. And mm-hmm. if we put soldiers there to be like, hey, look, this can't happen or mm-hmm. whatever. But it, it's it's such a... It's it's why so much more compl- my biggest thing with this conflict that pisses me off is people oversimplifying it. Yeah. Now, on the surface, it's very simple. Russia invaded here, but you're like, but wind back ten years, wind back to fourteen, mm-hmm. but then wind back to the Soviet and wind back. Look through these deals, look through agreements, and you know, there's been agreements broken heaps of times, mm-hmm. and agreements broken by different governments on yeah. both sides. On of both this sides. Too. Yeah. And you're like, hey, we have the response. I believe if America wants to be the world police. Which they are. They're saying we police the world. We should have been policing that these deals were done correctly too. Correct. That that then the Minsk one and two, that because people go well Ukraine broke it, but they weren't happy with how it was and it was bullshit. Okay, then America had some responsibility to like right, Belarus, Russia, Ukraine. What is actually happening on this? Correct. Now I don't. Agree, I also am not a component of America Being putting indoor, their fingers in every pie. I, I don't. I don't agree with that either. I'm like fuck off. Like yeah, let, sometimes let, in America are like, oh, your country can't do this. Yet. Why? Fuck off. Yeah. But for security things like that, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I agree. I don't. Whether I think it is right or wrong, whether you know a country is gassing its own people and and doing their thing, like do I think that's a hundred percent wrong? Obviously, you know, yeah. no, no, no innocent civilian needs to be killed or worry about their government doing things to them. But that's also n- not necessarily another country's responsibility to step in there and dictate what goes on in that country. Yeah. Now, if another country is invading another country and now, you know, committing genocides and, and all this stuff, okay, cool. Now it's the the um, uh, responsibility of other countries to help out. But, but we do it all the time anyway. Look, yeah, look we at do. Africa. There's... Genocides going on all the time, rearmaments, coups, all this shit. No one gives a shit. No one gives a shit. No one gives a shit. Look at the Middle East. It happens exactly. all the time too. No one actually no one actually gives a shit. Nope. Um it's just when they're and this is gonna sound horrific, but when it's white Europeans that affect us, that's when people start caring. That's that's true. And I've done some pieces on Iran, on Syria, no one cares. No yeah. one gives a shit. Like yeah. and I'm like fuck. Because no one knows where Syria and Iran and all those Middle Eastern countries are. Same it's thing with Africa. Nobody knows. Uh, people people think Africa is a country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why I talk to people. I'm like, yeah. they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to Africa. Okay, cool, cool. You know, what, what country are you going to? I'm going to Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the continent. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. But, but, but where in yeah, Africa? Yeah, yeah. That's like me saying like, I'm going to Asia. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool. Where? Where? Yeah. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going, you know, to, to China, whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I know a lot of my friends who work in Africa. Mm-hmm. On the contracting side, they're like, man, Wagner PMC, we had exposure to this 10 years ago. Like, we could have told you all about this. Like, they're like, hang on, they're just getting declared these all terrorist organisations over now. They're like, and my, my, my friends are disgusted by it because they're like, hang on, what the fuck? We've like, been watching it's taken this. this to declare it a terrorist org? They're like, you should have seen what we saw in Southeast Asia with Wagner and in Africa. And it said, if you, if, those crimes, they were crimes against humanity. Yeah. And they were like, and a lot of my friends like, oh, they're like, oh, I've seen nothing what Wagner has done in Ukraine that compares to what they did there of throwing oh, wow. coups. Oh, man. Some of my friends are like, bro, it was bad. And this was 10 years ago. Wow. When they work on the contracting side. Yeah. And they're like, man, we'd go to a village and it would just be whatever. And like, oh, this is well known. Wagner went, I don't know, this story makes me laugh that they went in and just stole a heap of gold and it just flew out of the lake. Like, this is ours. Goodbye. I actually, I remember however long that was actually sending it to my mates. Going, can you not do this? Like, can we just like hijack a C one thirty, land, stack up, and go? Just, just spitball in here. Figuratively speaking, could our unit possibly, allegedly, go in, take you know, a few thousand pounds of gold and, and leave, and have the yeah. gold disappear? Yeah. Hypothetically, yeah, yeah. Uh, literally. Um, and this will be the last question. On yeah, bud. The major offensives we're seeing happening, but the counteroffensives. Yeah. This has been much um, anticipated, mm-hmm. you know, what's going on. Mm-hmm. Do you have any sort of FOMO, like fear of missing out? Oh, man, every day, bro. Yeah. Every single day, man. Um, and actually, I, 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 was, I was just talking to uh, somebody the other day, and, uh, you know, he asked me, he goes, you know, if your eye gets better, are you wanting to go fight again? That was going to be our next question. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, yeah. And uh, honestly, dude, if I could see... 
if I could see out of my my eye right now, if I could if I if I knew I was gonna be able to see out of my eye perfectly within a month, I would have never left Ukraine. I would have never left maybe two months. I would have never left Ukraine. I would have stayed, I would have got better, and I would have gone back to fighting, man. I I'm not good at a lot of things. I'm really good at fighting. Um and I really enjoy it. Uh I'm an adrenaline junkie and I've never experienced adrenaline more than getting shot at. Um and I love it. Um, on top of, you know, my own personal things of uh, loving the adrenaline of it and everything like that, you know, doing, we're doing good work, you know, we're ridding, um, you know, a country that's, you know, just committing hate and turmoil on innocent civilians. Um, but yeah, man, I definitely have hardcore FOMO. Um, and if I could go back, I would, um, I don't think my eye will ever be, uh, in a, in a, in a, to a degree to where I'll be able to fight again. Um, because I am every, I'm right. eye dominant. all my tactics, all my training is all my muscle memory is, is, is right side. Um, I am a, I, I, I did, I have trained a lot. Um, even before getting hurt, um, doing things left handed, left eye, just in case if something were to happen and like I needed to, I could relatively accurately, you know, um, put, put rounds down range left side. Um, and I can do that. Um, but like I said, my muscle memory and my quick reaction is all right side. Yep. And I'm not going to put my boys in, in danger by, you know, I mean, you know, if you're in a tick, you know, seconds count. And, oh, yeah. and if I pop up right side, I might not have the second to go, oh, shit, yeah. and then go left. I'm not worried about myself. But again, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm worried about my, my guys. You know, I'm not going to put their life in jeopardy because I chose to go to go do stuff um, and to keep keep doing what I was doing. Um, and then he asked me, he was like, he was like, why don't, why don't you go train? Like, why don't you go over there and, and train more? And I told him, I was like, man, that's like telling an alcoholic or a druggie or drug addict. Like, Hey man, it's just one beer. It's just, it's just one line. It's just, a, it's just a line of Coke, man. You can, you can do just one line because yeah. the closer I am to it, I'm just going to be like, it's just one mission. Yeah. It's just one mission. I'm good. And then that one mission is going to turn to two missions and I'm going to be doing it for a month and then something's going to happen. Yeah. Or maybe nothing happens. Maybe nothing happens. Maybe I stay solid, but I'm not willing to to risk somebody else's life mm -hmm. just just to do it. Yeah. yeah, mate. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Is is there anything we've forgotten to mention? Is there anything you any stories any whatever like that we can go as we can go ten hours? I don't give a shit. Shit, man. I ain't got nothing to do today. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, nah, man. That's that's really the 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 nitty gritty of it. I mean, um. I mean, of course, there's always little bitty stories of, of different things. You know, I'm, I'll forget half of them while I'm talking. And then while I'm talking about one, I'll remember about another one. So, I mean, I mean, I spent almost a year in Ukraine. So, obviously, I have a, an incredible amount of stories about the place um, and the people. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, man, all in all, I think that's, I think that's the nitty gritty of it. Awesome. Well, we yeah. can do this again when I'm back here. Or yeah, man. Maybe, when, maybe, when, maybe when I when I go to Australia one day. Do it. You got yeah. to come. Yeah, man. I've always I keep, wanted to. I keep telling Texans, I'm like Australia's. People think Australia because they look at Melbourne and I'm like, no, no, no. Melbourne is our equivalent LA. Mm. So like, if you if you're an Australian, and you look at America. You're like, Fuck that. But you look you're looking at LA. You're not looking at other yeah. places. But I'm like, where well, I live, like Adelaide, Perth, whatever. That's like your, I mean, we call outback, but like your country cities. Yeah. They're fucking awesome. I'm like, you guys would love it. You got a lot of kangaroos? Heaps. Dude, I want to box one. Don't. Come. <laughs> well, a lot of my friends, a lot of my ex-army mates, they're all, um, a few of them are professional hunters too. Oh, dope. So they go shooting deer, kangaroo. I'm about to say, I do a lot of hunting here. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be gangster. And they do, um, in some of the ranges near me, like they'll do like four or five day hunts, like stalk for days. Heck yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's fun Because kangaroos right are vermin too. Yeah, that's right. It's like our um, uh, squirrels here. Yeah. They're like squirrels for us. Yeah. Like, like we, you have to cull. It's actually, like, and this is what people don't understand, it is healthier for the kangaroo's population to shoot them. Yeah. Um, you need to, because otherwise they'll all bloody stuff. What's better? Would you rather get shot in the head or starved to death? Exactly. They, they overbreed and then they, and then they, they starve out the other. They, yeah. they eat and go through all this vegetation. Then this vegetation doesn't have enough time to regrow for the next season. So then they move on somewhere else and then yeah. it just, yeah. And the leather is awesome. So kangaroo skin, like leather, mm -hmm. I think has 10 times the tensile strength and like, it's like 20 times the piercing strength of cowhide. So I can get like 
um, kangaroo boots. Yeah, so the best motorbike jackets in the world, like the MotoGP riders, yeah. all the super expensive motorbike jackets are all kangaroo. Get out. And all the high-end soccer boots and footy boots, like the really high-end ones, are all kangaroo leather. Because, because it's like 10 times the strength. Yeah. They can make it a tenth as thick. Hmm. So it's, re- it's actually more common than people think. Um, kangaroo boots, you can buy kangaroo. They're fairly expensive, but yeah. like really, really high end. Wow. Super malleable because it's so thin. It's thin, Like yeah. it's a tenth as thick, but as strong. Yeah, I it's got, used in I got, a, I got, I got a lot of boots. So I might have to give me a, a pair. I might have to go shoot me a kangaroo and then get some kangaroo I know, boots. I know a place that'll make you a pair of kangaroo boots. Hell yeah! Make you full custom cowboy boots, kangaroo. Ooh. There's legit. But people don't understand. Australia has like legit cowboys. Like yeah, drogues. yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I looked up a farm. My, my, I was at a bar. The other day, my friends didn't believe me of how big some of the station farms are, mm. and I, I won't remember the number correctly, but I think it was. 6.2 million acres or something. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to google oh, it on here. Man, I would, um, whoo, I would hate to work it, but I'd love to own it. Oh man. Um it's it's awesome. Like horseback like full on yeah. cowboys. Well, Ukraine Ukraine has cowboys also. Yeah. Uh, there's 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 a few times I'd, I'd go to different villages or whatever and there there would be some cowboys in there. Granted, you know, they don't you know, they don't wear hats like me and you know, they got, you know, cowboy boots and you know different stuff and they don't do rodeos, but I mean, all in all, basic. They're out there. They're working their livestock. They're working the land. You know, they got yeah. horses. They work horses. Uh, actually, I did. Uh, I did meet one Ukrainian. He uh, he he came to the states and rode a motorcycle all through America, like all the way around a big loop back in early two thousands, I think. And uh, he owns a ranch in Ukraine, and uh, he ended up getting a uh, a rope to to just because he they I guess they don't use rope the same way we rope here. And I was talking to him. I was like, I was like, how? Uh, before I went to Ukraine, I was getting into team roping and you know rodeo and and stuff. And uh, he was like, I have a rope. I was like, what? So we 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 threw the rope out there a little bit and you know t- toss some rope and everything. It was fun. It That's was, awesome. but, but yeah, just every every country has. I mean, even even like Mexico, they have vaqueros. You know, yeah. it's cowboy. You know, obviously they're not going to be the same, but the basic principles are all the same. Yeah. yeah. yeah so the biggest farm, five point eight. Uh, sorry. 5.85 million acres, which is bigger than Israel. That's one ranch. It's awesome, oh. man. That's some, that's some cool shit. But that is cool. Mate, it's been a fucking pleasure. Yeah, man. I've really enjoyed myself. Thanks for, thanks for having me. And we'll do this again. Yeah, man. Absolutely. And thanks thanks for having me done, and I hope, I hope you feel up. And Where can people find you or support you or anything? Yeah, man. Um, so... My Facebook is uh, is more private. That's like my. I mean, I don't really post on Facebook, anyways. But that's more friends and stuff like that. But uh, Instagram, same way, same way. You you hit me up. Uh, that guy sleazy S L E E Z Y for Instagram, and then uh, my YouTube channel, um, which is just some some basic uh, combat footage, me getting blown up, shooting the tank, stuff like that. That's on YouTube. Same name, that guy sleazy. And then uh, I've been thinking about doing this. Um, you should, uh, man. I've been I've been thinking about it. Uh, I don't, I don't know what I would do, how I would do it, or what. But if if I do, it'd probably be the same thing on on my YouTube channel. So, if people like and subscribe, they'll either figure out that I did a podcast, or they'll learn that I didn't do it. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. Well, mate, thank you so much. Yeah, man, Appreciate absolutely, it. bud. Cheers. Appreciate it.